It is Friday the 22nd of December. Welcome to Friday Night with Neil Patterson. This is the show where we take all of the news, the good bits and the bad, and dissect them for your entertainment. Tonight we'll be speaking to our panel here in the studio. Later on we'll get a culture fix with Anna Smith. We'll be reviewing the latest releases in the world of cinema as well as the best of the festive films. But first the headlines this hour. And after days of heavy negotiation, the United States has backed a watered down UN resolution to increase humanitarian aid to Gaza. Police launch a criminal investigation into the alleged abduction of Alex Batty, who went missing six years ago, whilst on holiday in Spain, aged 11. And police tried to stop the Prague gunman before he killed 14 people in the Czech Republic's worst ever mass shooting. Traffic jams, cancelled trains and millions making the Christmas getaway but drivers are warned to leave it late to avoid the queues. That's a haircut and a half. Uh, Wham! tops the charts at Christmas for the first time almost 40 years after their festive hit was first released. Coming up, I will be joined by our news reviews, the comedian and virologist, Ria Lina, and the author and historian, Sir Anthony Seldon. Both of them here until nine o'clock, giving us their take on the week's news and the stories that are continuing to gain momentum as we head into the Christmas weekend. And there's plenty to discuss, including a prime minister leaving Downing Street by the back door and sneaking out a late night U-turn on one of his key legal migration policies. At what of COVID, well, infections are once again on the rise, with around 1 in 24 people in England and Scotland likely to have tested positive in the past week. We'll discuss why you're more likely to have it if you're young and living in London or the southeast of England. Plus, in the sport, the alternative Christmas number one. Who's going to be sitting at the top of the Premier League table on Christmas Day? There's a good chance, whisper it, it could be Aston Villa. Great to have your company. We are here for the next three hours. Hold on tight. Friday night. Evening all. Uh, we begin in New York, where after days and long nights of negotiations to avoid a US veto, the UN Security Council has now voted in favour of a new resolution to increase aid into Gaza. But the draft does not call for a ceasefire. Instead, the language has been watered down and calls instead to create conditions for a sustainable cessation of hostilities, their words. It also requests the UN Secretary General appoint a humanitarian coordinator to oversee and speed up the delivery of aid into the territory. Sky's Nicole Johnston has our first report. Uh, well, we appear to have some problems with that report, uh, but let's find out exactly what's been going on in Washington. Our US correspondent Mark Stone is there and he can uh, bring us up to date. Uh, Mark, let, let, let's start with the tale of what happened at the Security Council itself. Uh, we saw votes not that long ago which wasn't successful. Why was this one able to get across the line? Uh, because they they made sure that the perfect didn't get in the way of the good, um, uh, to, to borrow a phrase used by one of the diplomats uh, there. Uh, you'll remember, you're right, it was back at the beginning of, of December. Uh, they, uh, the United Arab Emirates um, tried to push through a vote uh, which was calling for an immediate ceasefire, uh, and it was vetoed by the United States, um, and so it didn't pass, uh, and, and that left many people scratching their heads wondering wondering why. Well, the, the reason why that didn't pass is because the Americans believed, uh, and, and indeed their close ally Israel believed, that a ceasefire would only ben benefit Hamas. Uh, and so fast forward to today or to this week, because it has taken a week to get this resolution passed, they accepted that if they had that language in another resolution, that too would fail for the reasons I've just given. And so they, they looked at what they could do, what they could get passed, and they've massaged and moulded language over the course of the past week. Uh, that satisfies all sides, uh, and that is this resolution which passed 
uh, just after midday New York time today. Um, it is not perfect. By no means it's not. But it is good. Uh, it is a positive step forward because while it doesn't call for an immediate ceasefire, it does for the first time contain language uh, like the cessation of hostilities um, must come as, uh, as soon as is possible. Uh, and crucially, on the specifics of aid into Gaza, uh, it, it changes the way things will operate, or that it, it has, it, it, that's what it hopes to do uh, if all sides uh, abide by it, and the suggestion is uh, they will. And so aid will move into Gaza uh, in a, a faster way and in a greater way, um, which is, I think, absolutely vital. There will be a uh, the appointment of a of an individual, a, a UN appointed individual who oversees uh, this. Now, with all this, may sound like. Uh, like, like words and aspirations. But, but if it comes to pass, then on the ground it will make a material difference because at the moment very little aid is getting into Gaza compared to what is needed. And for me, Neil, um, the, uh, the whole thing was summed up by, by one word which was uttered a few times in, in the chamber of the Security Council, famine. Uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the ambassador to the United Arab Emirates said, let's be clear, unless we take drastic action, there will be famine in Gaza. She said that already half the population is starving. And over just such a short period of time from those Hamas attacks uh, back on the 7th of October uh, to, to where we are today, in such a short period of time, uh, famine is now a prospect. And indeed, the US ambassador, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, said that in her conversations uh, with aid agencies who are on the ground in Gaza, uh, in, in by no means the numbers needed, they are now starting to use the word famine uh, in their reports back uh, to, to, their, to their, um, uh, their superiors. I mean, th that is the state of, of how awful things are in Gaza now. And that is why this, while not perfect, uh, is a clear step forward. Uh, Mark, you, you were obviously uh, keeping keen eyes and ears across the Security Council discussions today and indeed in the past. I mean, am I right in detecting a, a, a significant toughening of the language from people who are technically allies of Israel in, in its war against Hamas? Um, without question, uh, yes. Uh, I mean, the outlier uh, on that, on the face of it at least, is the United States, which has been, um, some would say, stubborn uh, in its, um, or in fact, diplomats uh, have said, have used that word uh, to me over the course of, of this week. They've been slightly bewildered by America's uh, intransigence and un un unwillingness uh, to, to, to let this resolution pass until now. Now they finally have. But, but, America aside, other Western countries have, have undoubtedly shifted their language um, considerably uh, as a consequence of, of what is, is unfolding in Gaza. 20,000 people uh, dead uh, in, um, what is it, 74 days or, or so. Uh, that is an extraordinary number of, of people to, to have died. It is a, a Gaza health ministry figure, but we, we should always say that. But we should also point out that in all previous conflicts, the Gaza health ministry figure has proved to be accurate. Uh, the post-war analysis has, has proved that those numbers are broadly accurate. Uh, an extraordinary number of people to have been killed. The, the fighting goes on, the bombing goes on, uh, and of course behind all that are the secondary challenges. The, the deaths is the primary uh, problem, but behind that there is disease, there is famine, uh, there is medical care. All of that uh, is in such desperate need, which is why this is a step forward. Mark, many thanks. Now, a criminal investigation has been launched into the alleged abduction of Alex Batty six years after he went missing in Spain. The teenager who escaped from the Pyrenees by flagging down a van driver has described wanting to leave his nomadic lifestyle. Alex Batty was 11 when he left the UK with mother and grandfather, but they were not his legal guardians, as Sadia Chowdhury reports. 2,269 days missing. But in a note left behind for his mum, Alex doesn't say why he finally fled. Instead, the boy, now 17, told a newspaper harsh living conditions drove him to escape. It was a lot of construction work, demolition work, um, decoration work, painting walls, renovation work. I had a non-existent social life, to be honest. I would. Um, as much as I could, I'd try and play uh, video games online because I had a couple online friends, but, you know, you can't really class them as friends, can you? Alex Batty was 11 when he and his mother went missing. 
Last week, he left in an escape, now making headlines. His unbelievable journey, now followed by an unbelievable reality. Being back with my grandma feels quite surreal. Every time I go to sleep, I feel like I'm going to be waking up back in France. It's not really kicked in yet that, that I am back in England. And back in his previous hometown of Manchester. Police there have spoken to him. Alex's disappearance is now the subject of a criminal investigation launched by Greater Manchester Police. The first step in the case actually coming to criminal courts with Alex's mother coming back to this country. And that would have to be through extradition. It's only a criminal offence if Alex was actually removed from this country without consent of his grandmother. Um, it wouldn't actually be a criminal offence if, as we've read, this was an, a pre-arranged holiday agreed with the grandmother. Alex's great escape is beginning to sound not so great. He's admitted making up dramatic stories about his journey so police wouldn't find his mother. If she's watching, he wants her to know this. I tell him I love him. I tell him I'm sorry for leaving, but it was necessary for my future. Um, I was good, happy, very happy, actually. Um, healthy. You know I love the cold, so <laughs> we've got, I've got that again. Um... That's it, really. You know I can take care of myself, so you don't have to worry about any of that. The teenager says he now wants to focus on his future. Dreams and ambitions, he says, worth leaving home for. Sadia Chowdhury, Sky News. Police in Prague have released body cam footage of the moment officers stormed a university during their response to a mass shooting. The footage shows armed officers entering a building and members of the public fleeing Charles University yesterday. The gunman, named in Czech media as 24-year-old David Kozak, opened fire in the philosophy department. Our Europe correspondent Adam Parsons reports from Prague. These the scenes as police in Prague pursue a gunman who has launched a horrific killing spree. We've had information that he's on the roof says this officer. David Kozak is on the balcony and he's firing shots. The police are moving up the building and they go out onto the balcony. They find the gunman has killed himself. Nearby, urgent medical attention. An officer wants tourniquets to treat life-threatening wounds. Among the victims, Lenka Lavkova, a professor, and Lucy Spindlerova, who was a student. Sergei Medvedev was laying flowers today. A professor at the university, he heard the shooting during his lecture and then helped his students to build a barricade. So we blocked ourselves uh, inside the auditorium. We took all the desks and chairs towards the door, so we blocked the door entrance, I locked the door. An hour later, um, the special forces uh, broke in for the second time, then lay us all on the floor. And then they took us out uh, of the building, um, and as we walked uh, down the stairs, there was blood all over the place. There was uh, blood on the stairs, blood on the steps. Kozak was 24, a history student with no criminal record, but he had built up a cache of weapons and ammunition. His attack forcing some people to take desperate measures to avoid being caught while others were rushed out in a bewildered crowd. And Kozak is now being linked to the murder of his own father and to this, the killing of a man and his baby last week. There are relevant indicators and clues that suggest that the same offender was responsible for all three of these incidents. The police have already arrested at least one person who claimed he wanted to emulate the massacre. People here are anxious. The police say they're stepping up their profile to calm nerves. This is a city and a country in a state of trauma. At these impromptu memorials, you see tears, but what you hear is silence. But these people know that this dreadful massacre could have been even worse. When the gunman died, he still had a huge supply of unused ammunition.
This is a city with a low crime rate. Kozak's brutal, callous killing spree has come as a devastating shock. Adam Parsons, Sky News, Prague. Uh, much more on that story, of course, on our website. Uh, now, have you decided to delay your Christmas travel plans or perhaps even stay at home? A combination of the weather, traffic snarl-ups and problems on the trains. Well, taken together, it's all doing its best to make travelling as arduous as possible. Rail operators say tonight and tomorrow will be the busiest times to travel before Christmas. On the roads, the REC estimates that 13.5 million journeys will take place in Britain this weekend. That's up 20% on last year. Sky's Becky Cottrell has the latest. Kicking off the holidays by getting in the car. Millions making festive trips to join family and friends. But today had all the ingredients for travel chaos, with many people finishing work or school and hitting the road. It's been um, busier than we anticipated. We were quite pleased this morning. We had um, a, a, you know, a, a bit of an uplift around about six, seven, eight o'clock. And we think that's probably people taking our advice and uh, doing some of the longer journeys, getting that part underway early on. National Highways has removed more than a thousand miles of roadworks on England's motorways to help ease congestion. But at Dover, car and lorry drivers faced long queues following strikes by French workers. As for those travelling in electric vehicles, there were fears following queues like this at charging stations last year. 2023 has been a, a really great year for EV charging, particularly the rollout of those rapid and ultra rapid chargers that EV drivers need when they're on longer journeys. And if you look at the numbers overall, there are 40% more units, devices in, in the ground than there were this time last year. And in fact, recently there was a milestone in the UK 10,000 rapid or ultra rapid devices across 5,000 charging locations. And good news for many rail passengers, with the majority of services back up and running after havoc caused by Storm Pier. We actually managed to get to the station very early, so we're here an hour earlier than we would have been, so it's worked out OK. <laughs> this weekend could be even busier for travellers, particularly on the roads. The advice for those buying some last-minute gifts or trying to get away, get up nice and early or save your trip for later in the evening. Becky Cottrell, Sky News. Uh, well, what of the economy as we move into 2024? Well, in the third quarter of this year, it flatlined, prompting fears that the UK might soon be falling into recession. The Office for National Statistics says that gross domestic product contracted by 0.1% between July and September. Growth of 0.2% in the second quarter of the year has also been revised down to zero. Our business correspondent, Paul Kelso, has been speaking to businesses in Bristol. If you can't celebrate this weekend, you never will. And Christmas has delivered the seasonal shock this Bristol restaurant has been waiting for after another very trying year. In places, it's, it's been amazing. And in certain places, it's been, ooh, you know, this is uh, a little bit, a little bit sketchy here and there. It's the back end that people don't see, you know, the back of the house, it's the, you know, rise in utilities, it's the energy costs, you know, obviously it's the kind of staff costs which is also going up. It's something you can't paint a picture for guests. It's a recipe for hard work that's been repeated across an economy that's performing even worse than we thought. New data from the Office for National Statistics has revised down growth for the second and third quarters of the year. Growth of 0.2% in quarter two reduced to zero and in quarter three from flatlining to minus 0.1. These are small margins, but they put the UK on the brink of a technical recession and the Prime Minister, who pledged to deliver growth, on the defensive. Compared to the predictions at the beginning of the year, the economy has done better and we've actually grown faster than our European neighbours like Germany, for example. Uh, but of course we want to see more growth. Christmas has also come to the rescue for retailers in Bristol's arcade. Small businesses who've spent the year battling inflation, just like their customers. I try to plan forward in advance, so I'm already considering next year's wage increase. Um, so I need to adjust the hours of the shop, maybe open a bit longer to get more sales in. When the system slams you with big energy costs, high is the interest rate, rents go up. Come on, anyone can see what they're doing to the people, innit? 
Even in tough times, we make an exception for spending at Christmas, but economically, it feels like the hangover has come early. In truth, we'd expect the economy to slow with interest rates rising. And if there is something under the tree, it's that inflation is falling faster than expected. So this may not last quite as long. <laughs> The experts know you can't keep everyone happy at Christmas. There we go. Come January, belt tightening may be less a New Year resolution than a necessity. Merry Christmas. Paul Kelso, Sky News in Bristol. A uh, couple of the day's other headlines now. And a work by Banksy has been removed from a street in South London just after the artist appeared to confirm that the work was his. The artwork, which shows images of military drones on a stop sign, appeared near a zebra crossing in Peckham. But within an hour of the elusive artist sharing the image on social media, two men were seen taking it down. And 39 years after its release, Wham's Last Christmas has finally made it to the festive number one slot. The 80s heartthrobs, soft competition from Sam Ryder, and Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas, much to the delight of founding member Andrew Ridgely. It's a big moment for uh, me and for everyone involved with Wham and, and George Michael. You know, it, when Yogg wrote this track, he wrote it with number one in mind. That was the goal. Um, you know, he happened to write a, a song that distills the essence in an audio sense of Christmas. The Christmas number one is, uh, is an extraordinary achievement and, and uh, in this case, especially, <coughs> especially because this song was, was written for that in many, many ways. You're watching Friday Night here on Sky News. Coming up, we will be reviewing the week's news with the help of Really and Sir Anthony Seldon. Uh, and what are we going to be talking about? Well, we start with a story that you might have missed, uh, but only because they wanted you to. It's certainly only been a couple of weeks since the government announced radical plans to reduce legal migration, but there has already been a late-night U-turn on family visas. Uh, plus the news none of us wanted just before Christmas. Covid is making a comeback, not that it ever went away. Uh, but we will be taking a look at why younger people are now being affected. Martin Brunt and I'm Sky's crime correspondent. My most memorable story was and still is the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. Please, please do not hurt her. Please give our little girl back. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. For detectives, the first 48 hours after a murder are crucial in the search for clues. The public expects them to find Jill Dando's killer soon. The British detectives are planning to meet forensic experts, academics and even witch doctors. I remember the grimmest case, the Soa murders of schoolgirls Holly and Jessica. I felt I can't undo what's happened, but I can help explain it. Come on. Ian Huntley was arrested and charged within a fortnight of the murders. I've never murdered anyone. I've never raped anyone. What am I in jail for? The parole board has to decide if Bronson needs to be kept locked up for the safety of the public. My biggest challenge was to persuade a jail diamond thief to answer my letters. Martin Brunt, Sky News at the Old Bailey. Five of us have made it out of the car. Well, 
welcome to Backstage, the film and TV podcast. Welcome back to Friday Night with Neil Patterson. Uh, time to introduce our panel with us for the next two hours, the comedian and virologist Ria Lena and the educator, author and historian Sir Anthony Selden. Uh, great to have you both here. Um, where shall we start? Uh, well, yeah, last night, just as many people were putting their out-of-office on, <laughs> no-one here, obviously, uh, there was a surprise announcement from the government over their migration rules. Rishi Sunak has backed away from plans to sharply increase the minimum income needed to bring a foreign partner or spouse to the UK less than three weeks after announcing the policy. Well, the existing salary threshold is £18,600 for international workers to obtain a family visa. The Home Secretary had said that this would rise to £38,700 by next spring. But now the government says the threshold will rise just to £29,000, although this may still stop thousands of couples who thought they would be able to live together in the UK from being able to do so. It will not be seen in those terms by right-wing Tory backbenchers who've condemned it. So just what is this all about? Um, Rated to you first. We had the Home Secretary and his five-point plan. Mm. We had that eye-watering figure of 245,000, talking about net, net migration. But, but, but putting a kind of a, a price tag of £40,000 of a starting salary on being able to bring your, your wife or your husband to this country did strike me as a bit strange, given you know, what percentage of the British population actually earns that amount of money. Which, which I think they've realized in the past couple of weeks isn't as many as they thought. Mm. I mean, there's so much going on here. I mean, this is their attack on legal migration mm. because they've been trying desperately to handle illegal migration. They've been failing at that, not just in reality, but also in the, the opinion polls. And so now they're turning their, their, you know, they're turning to how can we control legal migration just to get those numbers down? Because it's all about how you fix the numbers, isn't it? And they, and they said, well, no one's changed this figure of 18,600 in 10 years. So we're, we're putting it up. And they haven't said that it won't end up at 38,700. They've just fact, said, Rishi for Sunak, now... Rishi Sunak has said that it will go up to that figure eventually. at the beginning of 2025, by which point we may well have seen a change of government. Well, precisely. So they haven't... Told, they, they've done that thing where they've gone, oh, um, what we originally said, we're not quite saying it, but actually uh, we, we kind of are still saying it. And mm. in order to, and they, and they released it late last night as well, yeah. right when we were looking at other things, hoping that we'd all miss it. I mean, just, just on that, Anthony, I mean, we have seen governments in the past, you know, attempting to bury bad news, but, but you know, the government performing a U-turn and then another U-turn today doesn't look good on something which supposedly they think is going to be central to winning the next general election. Well, that's what governments do, don't they? Um, they um, become governments because they're wily and, uh, and uh, so do the people who uh, they employ to, 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 to uh, be their political spin doctors. And um, so, 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 so who'd be surprised by that? Um, but, but, but why have the Conservatives historically had a bit of an issue with this? I, I, I remember thinking, when doing this job back in 2010, when the Conservatives came in, you know, this was an opportunity for a right-of-centre government to make the economic case for migration to this country. And, and frankly, both sides of the political divide have, have singularly failed to do so. So I used to run a university, uh, and universities uh, thrive enormously. The economy thrives enormously from people coming into it and bringing uh, all their, the, 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 their ideas and, and their skills. Uh, it's an enormous uh, tonic to any economy. But the right wing of the Conservative Party, who have um, created havoc in the last 14 years of Conservative mm -hmm. governments um, and uh, were responsible for Brexit, I, I think are now uh, uh, thrashing around. I mean, Brexit clearly hasn't been the economic miracle or the sovereignty miracle, or the anything miracle that uh, they told us it would happen, but uh, immigration it was supposed to sort out, but it, but it, 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 it didn't, did it? And, and now they're just uh, looking, and I think the prime minister is trying to just throw scraps of red meat to his right wing in the forlorn hope that it will uh, shut them up. But you know, you throw them scraps, and they just want more. They are insatiable. In their appetite. I mean, Ria, just a quick, quick thought from you on, on on the fact that you know sometimes you know three word slogans like "take back control" mm. really are nothing more than three word slogans, aren't they? 
Well, it's, it's all bite-sized politics, isn't it? And what you're trying to do is not get people to think too deeply about what's actually going on. So we keep it surface. And that's the same thing that we see here. We're focusing on migration in order to take the heat off of the cost of living crisis because that's, you know, the only people that are worried about migrants coming in and, and, and really taking a toll on the system are those that don't have enough to, to eat themselves. Mm. But we're not focused, but we're not solving the cost of living crisis. So let's, let's turn everyone's anger to migration instead. Uh, Ria, Anthony, uh, thank you very much for now. We've still got plenty to cover, including the new uh, transgender uh, rules inside schools, where we are with COVID. In addition to that, why don't we have a look at some of the best pictures that we have ever seen coming to us uh, from Iceland. No doubt about the most dramatic looking story of the week, that Icelandic volcano finally blowing its top. Uh, welcome back to Friday Night with me, Neil Patterson. Uh, this week, the government finally published its long-delayed guidance for England schools on youth transition. It promises a clear set of principles for teachers and staff as they wrestle with the needs of children who are questioning their gender identity. According to the Education Secretary, Gillian Keegan, the guidance puts the best interests of all children first. Uh, let's bring our panel back in at this point. Um, I mean, as, as I understand it, Anthony, the kind of the broad brushstrokes of, of Gillian Keegan's intervention are this, that we should have in our schools sex-separated toilets, that there should be fair and competitive sport, that parents should not be excluded from these, these big decisions, and that teachers should not have to accept all requests for, for social transition to be referred to by your chosen names and, uh, and pronouns. What, what do you make of this? I mean, it's a very, very difficult situation for both parents and teachers, I would imagine, to be in. So I, I've seen this as a 
head teacher over the years. And one thing I think very strongly, Neil, is that it really doesn't help to have the intense anger and heat that you get actually on both sides. Yeah. It really doesn't help the young people. It doesn't help clarity of thought. Um, and I think that on the whole, I think there's a lot to recommend Julian Keegan's proposals. Uh, I don't agree with every aspect of it, of but I think she is trying to get it right and involve the parents and uh, being careful about the pressure that can be put on young mm. people to transition as a way out of uh, maybe other problems that they've got. Um, and it's such a, a, a big thing in their lives that it's something that maybe uh, we just need to, to be careful about. But I come back to that, that excessive pressure and heat in this whole topic, which has been so damaging. Yeah, I mean, Ria, I, I personally, I would agree with that because, you know, this, this is a, it is very much a topic of our times. It is something that people have, you know, over the past few years, handful of years, it's been come, become part of the national conversation and for many people apparently kind of out of nowhere. But ultimately, we are talking about young people. We are talking about some, 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 some young people who, who need help. And, you know, you, you've got to have the child at the centre of the process, I would have thought. Yes, and I don't... Personally, having you know read the guidelines, I don't know that they totally are. Let's take mm. a step back and look at where these guidelines came from. They came, you know, initially the government wanted to just ban children being allowed to transition or present as they choose to present in schools, and they were told you can't legally do that without guidelines. So these are the guidelines that we've been waiting for for a number of years to help teachers and schools understand how better to deal with the situation. But I think what it's highlighted is that it's telling teachers what they can and can't do, what the parents, you know, where to bring the parents in, um, you know, how to handle the toilet situation at school. I, I feel that the young person is a little bit lost in the guidelines. You know, this what essentially we want is a safe space for all children to feel like they can be open about who, the, you know, what they're feeling. And, and I think what we've highlighted is that this is yet again being put on the teachers in the schools. Where is the support network? Where are the where where's the medical and the psychological expertise to help these you know to help these children through whatever they're going through? And I talk about all children. Yeah. They're missing. It, it, it is difficult enough being a teacher at the best of times. It's difficult enough being a teenager, frankly, at the best of times. Um, so let's move on to discuss uh, well some people who won't be spending Christmas with their loved ones. Uh, those who've opposed totalitarian authoritarian regimes. In Hong Kong, the publisher and pro-democracy activist Jimmy Lai has gone on trial for conspiring to collude with foreign forces to endanger national security and publish seditious material. Meanwhile, in Russia, the opposition leader and anti-corruption activist Alexei Navalny, who's been in prison since 2021, he has now vanished. We'll start, Anthony, with, with, with the situation in Hong Kong. I mean... <laughs> It, it sometimes strikes me that it feels like the United Kingdom has simply washed its hands of responsibility for what was our former former territory. What do you feel? Yeah, I, I think things about that, Neil. I also think, by the way, about teaching, just to mention a plug for teaching. Te I mean, I can't let you get away by saying that it's a... It, it, it's a too tough a profession. Oh, I mean, no, I mean, no, no, no. Your, your dad, my, was, your dad my was parents were both teachers. It is. They, to yeah. people, to, to, the, to the millions, billions, perhaps, listening to the programme tonight, I would say... It's the best profession anywhere. Good. Uh, you've got, you've Britain, got that in. Well done. Britain and Hong Kong. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, come on. Uh, uh, it, the, the, the values of liberty are being lost mm -hmm. and shouldn't be. And we're too concerned to uh, please what's happening in China, uh, the government. And there simply are uh, values which are uh, appropriate for any country, including yeah. freedom of speech. Uh, there were conditions that were set up when Britain left in 1997. Um, and I think, come on, Britain, uh, you can do better than that. Yeah, I mean, Ria, we, we look at the situation in Hong Kong, but I mean, the situation in Russia, I mean, Alexei Navalny, we probably shouldn't forget, went back to Russia of his own volition, know. knowing that he would probably, almost certainly, end up in a gulag and now has, has been disappeared. I mean, the man, if you don't know anything else about the man, you can certainly speak to his bravery. Yes, especially since, you know, he was he was out of Russia, having been poisoned and recovered from it. Uh, well, it, the timing's a little suspicious, isn't it? I mean, they last heard from him about three or four days before Putin announced that he was running again for election. Uh, but there's there is that small hope that he is being just transported between prisons because it can take up to a month sometimes to move them. And so... 
the hope is that he's just being moved and he hasn't disappeared and that they're not hiding health issues. So unfortunately, all we can do is sit and wait and hope he reappears. But of course, if they have moved him to, you know, to the far side of Russia, then it's going to make it even harder for him to reach his own legal team to be able to, you know, if at all, contact the outside world. So uh, I'm afraid we're just going to have to hope for the best. And we've got next year all these elections all around the world. And I think we have to, we're looking at the economic position later, but the political position in the world where we have oppressive regimes that want to, 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 uh, to, to, to suppress liberty and freedom of speech uh, is truly concerning. And it's not just in the countries uh, like with China and Russia, it is also what could be happening in the United States, the, the populist um, right. in populist the, right there, uh, if Donald Love Trump uh, wins, uh, who knows, uh, freedom, uh, the rule of law is on the retreat in the world. Mm. Uh, and uh, we have to be teaching young people about the importance of it rather than teaching people about mm, things that really don't matter. Mm -hmm. And recognise it when it's close to home. I mean, every time we protest, you know, this current government just changes the law on what we're allowed to do. So we're seeing it very close to home as well. And I think we need to be aware Vig of that. Vigilant. I Vigilant. think that is a very fair point. Um, but let's move on to, to another topic. Have you been hit by COVID this winter? Uh, COVID-19 infection levels are rising and more people, sorry, more people aged between 18 and 44 are catching it uh, than older people, new figures suggest. Around two and a half million people, or as many as one in 24 in England and Scotland, are likely to have tested positive for the illness in the past week. London and the South East, the worst affected regions. Um, Ria, to, to you first on this. Um, I, I, I suppose we just have to remain vigilant, don't we? We shouldn't necessarily be beginning to panic about a, a COVID, COVID wave surge, surging back, but, but those are alarming numbers. They're huge numbers. Mm. I think there's a number of things we need to realise. We are, we're having what's called a triple-demic mm. this winter, so it's not just COVID. We're also seeing flu and RSV numbers going up. RSV. RSV, uh, respiratory syncytial virus. Thank you. I mean, RSV. <laughs> uh, so, you know, which is cold, cold-like uh, presentation. Um, we're seeing a new variant now, and I know we used to name them now, they were just letters and numbers. So this one is JN1, and it's highly transmissible. Uh, we're looking at its transmission. We're looking at how it overcomes the immune system. Um, and we're all trained in how to deal with this. We know how to deal with this from the pandemic. If you're feeling ill, wear a mask, isolate from other people, try not to spread it, go and get a go and get a new test because even if you've hoarded covid tests at home they've probably expired so That's they the won't thing. be as a, they won't be effective at all mm. in letting you know accurately whether you have it or not and yes the current tests still are good for these new variants which is a big question mm -hmm. you want to know if this is a new variant will the old test still even work so do everything that you already know what to do in order to to, to stay safe and to keep others safe because all three of these things are, are, are running around. And the other thing to say is that at the moment, we're not worried about JN1 being like hugely different or, or but. but people are still getting quite sick from it. Mm -hmm. People are still suffering from long COVID. So do be conscientious to those around you. And I, and I suppose I the point to make, another point to make is, you know, I, I will guarantee that all of those who could have had a vaccine a booster this year, this in this period of the year, probably haven't done so. I don't know about you, but I haven't seen much in the way of government advertising about about that particular topic. And, and that's obviously now seems to be a shame and a mis mistake. But I mean, to get this right, Ria, it's nothing like as serious if you get it as if you got it back in 2020, 2021, right no, or wrong? Well, it's not as simple as that. I don't want people out there going, ah, it's just a mild cold and going around going, well, I've got it because it could affect someone around you yeah. far yeah. worse than it affects yourself. So still, please be conscientious of others. And that's one thing I noticed. I mean, just on the garage coming here tonight, there was a man who was just going around coughing everywhere and it was mm. absolutely mm. disgusting. And that wouldn't have happened back in 2021. 20, there would have been much more social pressure. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, to be careful for yourself, but above all, careful for other people around you. Mm. Uh, and the symptoms to be looking out for? <laughs> As as they were, you know, essentially, if you think you have a cold or you're suffering from, you know, a bad flu, isolate. Because while we can test for, for COVID with, with the store-bought test, we cannot test for flu or RSV. And they can be just, I mean, the flu, as we know, can be just as deadly, which is why we vaccinate every year. Exactly that. Uh, now, we couldn't review this week without mentioning the major uh, volcanic eruption in Iceland. Uh, molten magma turned the sky a dramatic orange for days and there were concerns that clouds of gas pollution could reach the capital Reykjavik. Let's take a look. 
In Iceland, there's been a major volcanic eruption following weeks of earthquakes. In the midwinter darkness, Iceland's newest volcano shows its colours. Unbelievable sight last night, uh, something we have never seen in all these eruptions here. So you can just make out the heat of that lava, 1,200 degrees centigrade, hot enough to melt iron. You would be uh, amazed by the power of modern nature. She's the posse. I mean, the, the, the power of the earth is one thing, but the beauty of it sometimes really does take my breath away. Anthony? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm just in awe. Uh, one or two of the bits there remind me of the title uh, sequence for The Crown, but uh, uh, that aside, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean the, the unbelievable, formidable power of the earth. Mm. It, 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 you know, it, what can one say? Rhea? I know, and and when I first heard that it erupted, I was worried because I'm I'm flying home for Christmas tomorrow, and I remember the last time a volcano erupted in Iceland. Well, I've, that stopped, I've, but I've got I've got a twenty pound note in my pocket for either member of the panel who can remember and pronounce oh, the name of no. that Icelandic volcano. I wouldn't even no. I wouldn't want to butcher it on that. Uh, go up. Go, twenty is not very much. Twenty five. Okay. Twenty five. Yeah, Christmas. Even, yeah, even since the program begun, the inflation rate. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I, I have it in front of me. Ejaf Jala Jokul. Yeah, that's not it. That's definitely not it. And apologies to our to our Icelandic viewers. Um, Ria, and <laughs> thank you so much for being here. We will be back with you uh, in the eight o'clock hour when we're going to be discussing uh, much more of the day's news. Uh, we, however, are going to be taking a short break. After it, we've got the sport. And who's going to be Christmas number one in the Premier League? Well, Aston Villa can claim top spot tonight if they beat. Sheffield United. We've done nearly 9,000 hours of rescue this year. Um, and we're an all volunteer team, so that puts quite a strain on all our team members. Um, so, yeah, we're looking at ways of reducing that number and keeping people safe on the hills. It has been tracking the number of visitors in the last few years. This increase over the last year, we don't really have enough data as to, to why that sudden increase of 25%. But generally, we, Snowdonia is getting a lot more visitors, and that just reflected in the, uh, the amount of rescues that we're carrying out. If they're on the mountain, they're part of you know the mountain community, um, even if it is just their first time, and we will step in and help out. Um, but we are looking at other agencies as well, working with other agencies to maybe see if we can do something to re reduce the sort of the low level rescues that we have to carry out as well. People who are not mountain aware don't realise the change in the weather from down in the valley to the summit and back again and how that can change, not just with the altitude, but during the day. So you could start off on a nice sunny winter's day. And by three or four o'clock, it's getting dark. The weather's closed in. You can't see where you're going. And suddenly it's sleeting and snowing. Um, and yet yeah, that can make a big impact on people's confidence and their ability to get off the mountain. We don't advise people not to go in the mountains. We don't see ourselves as gatekeepers. Um, the mountains are a great place to get fit. Um, it's acknowledged that spending time outdoors is great for your mental health. So we're certainly not gatekeepers. We just want people to ask some very simple questions about, do I know where I'm going, what I'm doing? Have I got a plan for the day? Have I got a plan B for the day? Um, do I know what the weather's doing? Not just what it looks like outside when I start, but what's the weather planning to do? Uh, bearing in mind that the mountain weather can be pretty unpredictable. And finally, do I have the right gear? And if you ask yourself all these questions, and you find some of them are you're not sure, then see what you can do to address it or come up with a different plan.
Welcome back to Friday Night with me, Neil Patterson. Never mind Wham, the real Christmas number one will be decided over the next 24 hours. Who will be top of the Premier League table come Christmas Day? Well, the current top two meet tomorrow evening, Liverpool hosting Arsenal at Anfield. Uh, but tonight, Aston Villa can claim top spot with a win against Sheffield United. Uh, making his first team debut on Friday night, Chris Latcham from Sky Sports News uh, joins us on the programme. Uh, good to see you, Chris. Hello, Welcome. Thank, Thank, you Thank you for being with us. It's a pleasure. It's great to be with you. Um, it's interesting, a bit of a throwback, isn't it? Wham, Christmas number one. It would feel like a bit of a throwback if a club like Aston Villa were the Christmas number ones in the English Football League, which is what they were back in 1986. But pointedly, Wham didn't get number one that year. That was Jackie Wilson, <laughs> Reed Petit, upsetting the apple cart. And that year, Arsenal were Christmas number one and they could well be this time around as well. Well, just, just, just reflect for a second then on, as you say, Aston Villa. Now, I am not the world's biggest expert on English football, but I would not have had them in, you know, someone said, name, name five teams who could be top of the Premier League this Christmas. Villa would not have been top of my list. Apologies to Villa fans. Hmm. I think they would accept your apologies and probably agree with you, Neil. It does seem out of step with what we've seen over the past few seasons, the Leicester season in 2015-16 aside, when Leicester came through uh, odds of 5,000 to 1 and won the Premier League. I'm sure we're all familiar with that. But their boss, Unai Emery, has lit a fire under this club. Last season, they were good. They qualified for Europe. They got into the European Conference League, which is not the top-tier Champions League, not even the second-tier Europa League. But it is still European football. And the mood lifted around the club. It was only a year ago they sacked Steven Gerrard and fans were saying, we're fighting relegation, what's going on with this football team? And they brought in this Spanish manager who had previously failed in his time in the Premier League with Arsenal and gone away, worked again in Spain, worked magic in Spain with Villarreal and then came back and is doing it at Aston Villa. And they are playing great football, specifically at Villa Park, where they're currently on a club record run of 15 home league wins in a row. Uh, and in that run, very recently, they beat Arsenal, they beat Manchester City. They're proving that they're not just flat-track bullies. They're beating the big guns in this division. Well, just, just, just briefly, um, Chris, because I've got to let you go and I've got to change my bets for the weekend. Now you've mentioned <laughs> Aston Villa. But, uh, but on form, Liverpool, Arsenal, who, who, who should be coming out on top? Liverpool are looking pretty tasty. And Liverpool are looking tasty. In midweek, they put West Ham to the sword in the EFL Cup. So that was their second string, in essence, beat them 5-1. And they are... Really rocking. But Arsenal, even when not particularly playing at their best, they're finding a way to win. They recently beat Luton 4-3 in a game where they trailed a couple of times, managed to come back and win it late in the game. It's cliche, but people would say that might be the form of champions. The one thing I would point out is, yes, we're looking at who might be the Christmas number ones. It's going to be Arsenal, Liverpool or Aston Villa. But ultimately, Manchester City are currently playing in the Club World Cup final and they'll be coming back hungry to try and climb back to the top. We will ask you about that later. Why don't you take us through the rest of the sport? Yeah, I certainly will. We'll start with uh, that Manchester City uh, game. They're currently playing in the Club World Cup final in Saudi Arabia and the full-time whistle has just gone. I can see the celebrations. They've beaten the South American champions Fluminense 4-0, beaten them at a canter. Two goals from Julian Alvarez. He scored the first and the fourth, bookending uh, a couple of goals that Phil Foden created. The first was an own goal. Foden got the second. And Manchester City are the club world champions for the first time. Elsewhere, Liverpool have become the sixth and final English club to, uh, from the original breakaway group to distance themselves from the new proposals for a European Super League. Their manager, Jurgen Klopp, says he is pleased that UEFA have been challenged, saying it is important European football bosses are reminded that they can't always do what they want. Just like it that we finally get a little bit of understanding that um, FIFA and UEFA and other FAs or whatever cannot just do what they want. Now across the city of Liverpool to a significant development at Everton. 777 partners have moved a step closer to a takeover of the club after being granted approval by the Financial Conduct Authority. The Miami-based company now only need approval from the Premier League to complete the deal to acquire Farhad Mashiri's majority shareholding in the club. Mashiri signed an agreement with 77 Partners in September, and if it goes through, they would acquire his 94% of Everton. Any prospective takeover remains subject to regulatory approval from the Premier League and the Football Association. Could be a poignant day for Luton tomorrow. They play their first game since Tom Lockyer's cardiac arrest. 
Lockyer has now been discharged from hospital after collapsing in last weekend's game against Bournemouth. His coach, Rob Edwards, has paid tribute to the medical staff from both clubs. I'm so proud of our, our medical guys, our staff, Bournemouth's uh, medics, the paramedics that were there as well at the time. They saved him. Um, they made every decision bang on under the scrutiny of everyone watching as well, the watching world. Um, so they did an incredible, incredible job. They're heroes. That's it from me, Neil. I hope you've had time to change your bet selections, but there's plenty more sport over on Sky Sports News right now, including the build-up to Aston Villa against Sheffield United. I'll be back in an hour. Chris, thanks very much. Yeah, you know, you're, getting, you're not getting any of my profits, believe you me. Uh, just a reminder, we will have our extended press preview and news review from half past ten this evening. Tomorrow's news and tonight's news and tomorrow's headlines. Uh, Anna Botting will be joined by the parliamentary sketch writer at the Daily Telegraph, Madeleine Grant, and the broadcaster and commentator, Alex Andreu. Uh, time now for a quick look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. Mm, and at this stage, it does look as though only parts of the north will be seeing a white Christmas as conditions remain mostly mild and windy in the run-up to the 25th. And you can guess where most of the rain is. Uh, this evening, rain spreading north will, becoming heavy, will become heavier. And with snow likely in the northeast, a few centimetres of lying snow possible, even at lower levels. Uh, elsewhere, just have a look at the temperatures there. It's going to be mild but pretty windy uh, with localised gales. Western upslopes will see a few outbreaks of light rain or drizzle. As snow showers will ease over Shetland tomorrow, rain over Scotland will spread back into Northern Ireland and Northern England. The colder air to the north likely to give a spell of snow or freezing rain for Northern Scotland. For the rest of the country, it will be mostly dry away from the western areas where there will be ongoing rain or drizzle. Central, southern and southeastern areas most likely to stay dry with some bright or sunny spells. Temperatures reaching double figures away from the chilly north. The weather. Sponsored by Qatar Airways. You're watching Friday Night with me, Neil Patterson. Coming up in the next hour, more on the UN Security Council finally agreeing on a resolution to get aid into Gaza. But what difference will it make on the ground? We'll be discussing that next. <laughs>
Welcome back to Friday Night with me, Neil Patterson. Coming up in the second hour of the show, our news reviewers are back to give us some of their picks of the week when it comes to making the headlines. And we're going to be paid a visit by comedy royalty. But first, tonight's top stories. And after days of heavy negotiation, the United States backs a watered-down UN resolution to increase humanitarian aid to Gaza. Police have launched a criminal investigation into the alleged abduction of Alex Batty, who went missing six years ago whilst on holiday in Spain aged 11. Traffic jams, cancelled trains and millions making the Christmas getaway, but drivers are warned to leave it late to avoid the queues. And wham, from top the charts, it went Christmas for the first time almost 40 years after this festive hit was first released. Coming up, our news reviewers, Rialina and Sir Anthony Selden, will be helping me with our regular feature, Good Week, Bad Week, as we decide who's had a sensational seven days and who's spent the week with their head in their hands. And it has definitely been a good week for the England goalkeeper, Mary Ernst, who was not only named Sports Personality of the Year, uh, but also managed to annoy the likes of Piers Morgan and Joey Barton in the process. Win-win. And speaking of sport and personalities, the in the league of their own start, Maisie Adam will be joining me in the studio to discuss the two big shows we can see her in this Christmas. Plus, not content with being treble winners, Man City are now champions of the world as well. In the last few minutes, they've won the Club World Cup. We'll bring you all the details. Great to have your company. We are here until 10 o'clock. Hold on tight. It's Friday night. Evening all. Uh, we begin in New York, where after long days and nights of negotiations to avoid a US veto, the UN Security Council has now voted in favour of a new resolution to increase aid into Gaza. But the resolution does not call for a ceasefire. Instead, the language has been watered down and calls instead to create conditions for a sustainable cessation of hostilities. Their words. Uh, it also requests the UN Secretary General to appoint a humanitarian coordinator to oversee and speed up the delivery of aid into the territory. Skies, Nicole Johnston has much more. Jabalia refugee camp in North Gaza where the war never seems to end. Israel has been dropping bombs here for weeks. <laughs> this woman keeps saying, they bombed us, they bombed us. <laughs> Look, this is my uncle Salem. Record this, let people see. There's no dignity in a death like this. These men say more bodies are buried under the rubble. The UN says nowhere is safe. And across Gaza, desperate demand for food, water and medicine. It's hard to find and costs a fortune. I go to the market looking for canned food, but where do I get the money to buy it? The Israelis forced us from one place to another, and now I can't survive. I can't get food for my children. But on the edge of Gaza, a small sign of hope. Israel's Kerem Shalom border crossing. Aid trucks are now entering from here, dozens a day. But Hamas says this week, Israeli forces killed the head of the crossing on the Gaza side in an airstrike. The IDF attacked Hamas militants that came with weapons to our border. The IDF does everything in our power from one hand to uh, reach our objectives of demolishing the terror regime of Hamas while operating this large-scale humanitarian operation. But to Gazans, this isn't enough. They want Karim Shalom crossing fully opened. It is the main commercial crossing into Gaza. It's the only one that can take hundreds and thousands of trucks into Gaza to try and help the situation there. Help must come fast. But diplomats have dithered. After a week of debate, the UN Security Council has finally passed a resolution to increase aid to Gaza, but not to end the war. 
Today, this council called for urgent steps to immediately allow safe, unhindered, and expanded humanitarian access and to create the conditions for a sustainable cessation of hostilities. It's not far enough for the UN Secretary General. A humanitarian ceasefire is the only way to begin to meet the desperate needs of people in Gaza and end their ongoing nightmare. Back in Gaza, people wait for food. They wait for the war to end. And the longer it drags on, the more they lose hope. Nicole Johnston, Sky News, Jerusalem. Now let's bring in our US correspondent Mark Stone in Washington, who's been monitoring that Security Council meeting today. And, and Mark, of course, at the Security Council, we had a very explicit warning of the conditions that there are in, in Gaza right now. Warning of, of, a, of a famine, of all things. Yeah, it was it was a, a very stark uh, moment uh, in the chamber when the ambassador to the United for the United Arab Emirates, uh, who who tabled this resolution, which has finally passed, said, "Let's be clear: unless we take drastic action, there will be famine in Gaza. Uh, already, half the population there is said to be to be starving, uh, and now." Uh, this word famine uh, is being used by aid agencies who are uh, who are there in in small numbers. Uh, look, Neil, I think there are two ways of looking at what has happened today uh, in New York. Um, it, it is positive. There's no question about that. That it is positive. While it doesn't call for a ceasefire, uh, the diplomats knew that if the language in that resolution had included the word ceasefire, it wouldn't pass at all because America would veto it because America believes that a ceasefire would benefit Hamas and would not allow Israel uh, or would not um, allow give the Israelis the ability to protect themselves. So whether you agree with that or not, uh, it is a fact that had they included that word in the resolution, it wouldn't have passed, and so the whole thing would be a waste of time. And so in their words, they didn't let the perfect get in the way of the good, uh, and so they, they tried something else, and they tried a, uh, a resolution which has now passed, which allows for aid to get in in much greater, uh, in, in, in larger quantities, which is absolutely key given, given what is happening in there, given the humanitarian uh, situation that in there. The other way of looking at this is, it is, is it just how damning an assessment it is of, of, of global diplomacy at the moment, that it has taken, what is it, 11 weeks uh, to come up with a form of words which does what? It, all it does is allow aid to get into people uh, who desperately need it. I mean, I mean, 11 weeks to come up with that. Um, that's not great. Uh, so those are the two ways of looking at it. But pragmatically, uh, the diplomats knew they needed to get something done. They wouldn't be able to get a ceasefire across the line. Uh, and so they have gone for this. And the aid is desperately needed. Uh, and as long as all this can be implemented, the aid will come now. Mark, many thanks. A criminal investigation has been launched into the alleged abduction of Alex Batty six years after he went missing in Spain. The teenager, who escaped from the Pyrenees by flagging down a van driver, has described wanting to leave his nomadic lifestyle. Alex Batty was 11 when he left the UK with mother and grandfather, but they were not his legal guardians, as Sadia Chowdhury reports. 2,269 days missing. But in a note left behind for his mum, Alex doesn't say why he finally fled. Instead, the boy, now 17, told a newspaper harsh living conditions drove him to escape. It was a lot of construction work, demolition work, um, decoration work, painting walls, renovation work. I had a non-existent social life, to be honest. I would, um, as much as I could, I'd try and play uh, video games online because I had a couple online friends, but, you know, can't really class them as friends, can you? Alex Batty was 11 when he and his mother went missing. Last week, he left in an escape, now making headlines. His unbelievable journey, now followed by an unbelievable reality. Being back with my grandma feels quite surreal. Every time I go to sleep, I feel like I'm going to be waking up back in France. It's not really kicked in yet that, that I am back in England and back in his previous hometown of Manchester. 
Police there have spoken to him. Alex's disappearance is now the subject of a criminal investigation launched by Greater Manchester Police. The first step in the case actually coming to criminal courts with Alex's mother coming back to this country, and that would have to be through extradition. It's only a criminal offence if Alex was actually removed from this country without consent of his grandmother. Um, it wouldn't actually be a criminal offence if, as we've read, this was an, a pre-arranged holiday agreed with the grandmother. Alex's great escape is beginning to sound not so great. He's admitted making up dramatic stories about his journey so police wouldn't find his mother. If she's watching, he wants her to know this. I tell him I love him. I tell him I'm sorry for leaving, but it was necessary for my future. Um, I was good, happy, very happy actually, um, healthy. You know I love the cold, so <laughs> we've got, I've got that again. Um, that's it really. You know I can take care of myself, so you don't have to worry about any of that. The teenager says he now wants to focus on his future. Dreams and ambitions, he says, worth leaving home for. Sadia Chowdhury, Sky News. Police in Prague have released body cam footage of the moment officers stormed a university during their response to a mass shooting. The footage shows armed officers entering a building and members of the public fleeing Charles University yesterday. The gunman, named in Czech media as 24-year-old David Kozak, opened fire in the philosophy department. Our Europe correspondent Adam Parsons reports now from Prague. These are the scenes as police in Prague pursue a gunman who has launched a horrific killing spree. We've had information that he's on the roof, says this officer. David Kozak is on the balcony and he's firing shots. The police are moving up the building and they go out onto the balcony. They find the gunman has killed himself. Nearby, urgent medical attention. An officer wants tourniquets to treat life-threatening wounds. Among the victims, Lenka Lavkova, a professor, and Lucy Spindlerova, who was a student. Sergei Medvedev was laying flowers today. A professor at the university, he heard the shooting during his lecture and then helped his students to build a barricade. So we blocked ourselves uh, inside the auditorium. We took all the desks and chairs towards the door, so we blocked the door entrance. I locked the door. An hour later, um, the special forces uh, broke in for the second time, then lay us all on the floor. And then they took us out uh, of the building, um, and as we walked uh, down the stairs, there was blood all over the place. There was uh, blood on the stairs, blood on the steps. Kozak was 24, a history student with no criminal record, but he had built up a cache of weapons and ammunition. His attack forcing some people to take desperate measures to avoid being caught, while others were rushed out in a bewildered crowd. And Kozak is now being linked to the murder of his own father and to this, the killing of a man and his baby last week. There are relevant indicators and clues that suggest that the same offender who was responsible for all three of these incidents. The police have already arrested at least one person who claimed he wanted to emulate the massacre. People here are anxious. The police say they're stepping up their profile to calm nerves. This is a city and a country in a state of trauma. At these impromptu memorials, you see tears, but what you hear is silence. But these people know that this dreadful massacre could have been even worse. When the gunman died, he still had a huge supply of unused ammunition. This is a city with a low crime rate. Kozak's brutal, callous killing spree has come as a devastating shock. Adam Parsons, Sky News, Prague. Uh, more on that story on the website. Now, 
Have you decided to delay your Christmas travel plans or even stay at home? A combination of the weather, traffic snarl-ups and problems on the rail network, well, taken together, they're doing their best to make travelling as arduous as possible. Rail operators say tonight and tomorrow will be the busiest times to travel before Christmas. On the roads, the RAC estimates that 13.5 million journeys will take place in Britain this weekend, and that's up 20% on last year. Sky's Becky Cottrell has the very latest. Kicking off the holidays by getting in the car. Millions making festive trips to join family and friends. But today had all the ingredients for travel chaos, with many people finishing work or school and hitting the road. It's been um, busier than we anticipated. We were quite pleased this morning. We had um, a, a, you know, a, a bit of an uplift around about six, seven, eight o'clock. And we think that's probably people taking our advice and uh, doing some of the longer journeys, getting that part underway early on. National Highways has removed more than a thousand miles of roadworks on England's motorways to help ease congestion. But at Dover, car and lorry drivers faced long queues following strikes by French workers. As for those travelling in electric vehicles, there were fears following queues like this at charging stations last year. 2023 has been a, a really great year for EV charging, particularly the rollout of those rapid and ultra rapid chargers that EV drivers need when they're on longer journeys. And if you look at the numbers overall, there are 40 percent more units, devices in, in the ground than there were this time last year. And in fact, recently there was a milestone in the UK, 10,000 rapid or ultra rapid devices across 5,000 charging locations. And good news for many rail passengers, with the majority of services back up and running after havoc caused by Storm Pia. We actually managed to get to the station very early, so we're here an hour earlier than we would have been, so it's worked out OK. <laughs> this weekend could be even busier for travellers, particularly on the roads. The advice for those buying some last-minute gifts or trying to get away, get up nice and early or save your trip for later in the evening. Becky Cottrell, Sky News. Now let's turn to the economy, which flatlined in the third quarter of this year, prompting fears that the UK may well fall into recession. The Office for National Statistics says that GDP contracted by 0.1% between July and September. Growth of 0.2% in the second quarter has just been revised down to zero. Our business correspondent, Paul Kelso, has been speaking to people in Bristol. If you can't celebrate this weekend, you never will. And Christmas has delivered the seasonal shop this Bristol restaurant has been waiting for after another very trying year. In places, it's, it's been amazing, and in certain places, it's been, ooh, you know, this is uh, a little bit, a little bit sketchy here and there. It's the back end that people don't see, you know, the back of house. It's the, you know, rising utilities. It's the energy costs. You know, obviously, it's the kind of staff costs which is also going up. It's something you can't paint a picture for guests. It's a recipe for hard work that's been repeated across an economy that's performing even worse than we thought. New data from the Office for National Statistics has revised down growth for the second and third quarters of the year. Growth of 0.2% in quarter two reduced to zero and in quarter three from flatlining to minus 0.1. These are small margins, but they put the UK on the brink of a technical recession and the Prime Minister, who pledged to deliver growth, on the defensive. Compared to the predictions at the beginning of the year, the economy has done better and we've actually grown faster than our European neighbours like Germany, for example. Uh, but of course we want to see more growth. Christmas has also come to the rescue for retailers in Bristol's arcade. Small businesses who've spent the year battling inflation just like their customers. I try to plan for it in advance, so I'm already considering next year's wage increase. Um, so I need to adjust the hours of the shop, maybe open a bit longer to get more sales in. When the system slams you with big energy costs, high is the interest rate, rents go up. Come on, anyone can see what they're doing to the people, innit? Even in tough times, we make an exception for spending at Christmas. But economically, it feels like the hangover has come early. In truth, we'd expect the economy to slow with interest rates rising. And if there is something under the tree, it's that inflation is falling faster than expected. So this may not last quite as long. <laughs> 
Well, the experts know you can't keep everyone happy at Christmas. There we go. Come January, belt tightening may be less a New Year resolution than a necessity. Merry Christmas. Paul Kelso, Sky News in Bristol. And we've just got time to squeeze in one more story before the break. Let's have a listen to this. Thirty-nine years after its release, Wham's Last Christmas has finally made it to the festive number one slot. The 80s heartthrobs saw off competition from Sam Ryder and Mariah Carey, much to the delight of founding member Andrew Ridgely. It's a big moment for uh, me and for everyone involved with Wham and, and George Michael. You know, it, when Yogg wrote this track, he wrote it with number one in mind. That was the goal. Um, you know, he happened to write a, a song that distills the essence in, in an audio sense of Christmas. The Christmas number one is uh, is an extraordinary achievement, and and uh, in this case, especially, <coughs> especially because this song was was written for that in many many ways. And did you know? that George Michael was just 21 when he wrote that, and he played all the instruments on Last Christmas, including with sleigh bells. I just found that out on the internet. Anyway, coming up next, our news reviewers, Rialina and Sir Anthony Seldon, they will be back with us and helping us with our regular feature. Good week, bad week, including, and who could have thought it? It's someone with an actual personality being named Sports Personality of the Year. Uh, just a little later, we'll be joined in the studio by the comedian Maisie Adam, who's going to be dominating your TV screens this Christmas. We'll be back in a moment. People would have seen things in the last two months, which we'll never forget. Three, two, one! We are the both sides can see themselves as being the victim of what's taking place. Stop the murdering of innocent Israelis and Jews! They're not terrorists. They're absolutely not. I still feel connected to being a mother. Who's fire now? People are scared. They're worried. That's what it feels like to be a Jew in UK in 2023. <laughs> in Brunt and I'm Sky's crime correspondent. My most memorable story was and still is the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. Please, please do not hurt her. Please give our little girl back. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. For detectives, the first 48 hours after a murder are crucial in the search for clues. The public expects them to find Jill Dando's killer soon. The British detectives are planning to meet forensic experts, academics and even witch doctors. I remember the grimmest case, the Soham murders of schoolgirls Holly and Jessica. I felt I can't undo what's happened, but I can help explain it. Come home. Ian Huntley was arrested and charged within a fortnight of the murders. I've never murdered anyone. I've never raped anyone. What am I in jail for? The parole board has to decide if Bronson needs to be kept locked up for the safety of the public. My biggest challenge was to persuade a jail diamond thief to answer my letters. Martin Brunt, Sky News at the Old Bailey. Five of us have made it out of the car. Well, 
welcome to Backstage, the film and TV podcast. Uh, welcome back to Friday Night, and we continue our review of the week's news. And it's at this point we ask, who has had a good week and who's had a bad one? The weekend is here, Christmas is round the corner, so who's relieved it's all over, and who has finished the winner? Still with me, of course, uh, Rialina and Sir Anthony Seldon. Um, and let's start on a high, shall we, and mention Mary Earps, the, the England goalkeeper, named Sports Personality of the Year, and... And what's even better than that, the decision has got right up the noses of <laughs> Piers Morgan and Joey Barton. You're a big Joey Barton fan, Anthony, aren't you? Don't worry, I'm coming to you. Love her, love her. <laughs> brilliant. Um, Ria, what do you make of this? I mean, I, don't, I have to admit, I expected that there would be a little bit of backlash when I saw who had, who had won it, just because this is the United Kingdom and we tend to do that when a woman wins a, a, wins anything? a prize. Anything? Yeah, exactly. Just anything. Yeah. Um, I mean, we have to remember, this was a public vote. Mm -hmm. So this is what the public said. I, you know, and, and it isn't who did the best in sports this year, which I think was part of what Piers was complaining about. Yeah, oh, other people point. did better. You know, this is sport personality of the year, i.e., which sport person do we remember for the totality of what they achieved? And she had she, her no, fight but against Nike. But let's be fair, she, 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 she didn't win anything. You didn't win the no. World Cup, and her club didn't win either. But she did make progress in terms of her fight against Nike. That's right, I said Nike. That's true. Um, we're going to get letters about that. Uh, and when they wouldn't publish her jersey because they went, no one would buy it. And, mm. of course, after enough publicity, they, it sold out, um, so Nike won anyway. And and then, uh, and of course, people remember her for her, her colourful language mm -hmm. during during the games, which I think, you know, just humanised mm. the whole game, and, and we loved her for that as well. And here's another point that you didn't know about Mary, uh, I bet you didn't know, nope. Neil, either, which is that rather than a lot of these young kids, I mean, they've come through the schools that I've been at, they all want to be professional sports women, sports men, and they don't go off to uni. And, you know, the career either happens or doesn't happen and it's over by late 20s. She went to uni, grounded out for four years, Loughborough, great university, got a degree, and I think that's really going to underpin her for when she ceased to be goalkeeper and ceased to be personality of the year. You know, she's got something really serious there. Education, 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 as uh, somebody once said. Indeed, someone... So, yeah, I, it, I can almost uh, remember who it was. Uh, it was Tony Blair, but John Major also uh, was rather disgruntled when Tony Blair said it, because actually he said, I thought I had the same three priorities, but I had them in a different <laughs> order, he said. <laughs> Very good. Uh, we will move on. Um, Ria, tell us why... Uh, Pope Francis has yes. made it what, a, a good week for same-sex couples. This is an interesting one. You know, I was thinking about this story after we said, let's talk about this in Good Week, and mm. I went, who is it a good week for? So so Pope Francis, as we know, is probably the most progressive pope that the, that the Catholic Church has seen in a while. And he has said, we've got to stop pushing against, you know, what, what modernity. We have mm. to stop pushing against it. And he said that now... Um, that I don't even know his staff. It's not called staff, is it? But the people in the church beneath them mm. can bless a same-sex marriage. Bishops. Bishops and below. Priests. As long as mm. it doesn't look like marriage. So it, you know, it, it's a push in the right direction, I suppose. But it isn't. It isn't all the way there. It can't become part of, um, a, you know, the process of the church or the liturgies. Am I saying that right? Liturgy. Yeah, it's very good. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think there's there's some progress being made. If if you are in the church and and you are same sex and it means you know a lot to your mm. spirituality, then I suppose this is, you know, a small push in the right direction. I am all for encouraging that kind of thing, but it's not where I think many of the rest of the world thinks it should be. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, think, I think that may well be a point. Yeah, and, and look, I think he's, a, he's an incredible figure and, mm. and global leader. Not a lot of competition from other global leaders, but I think that his cause, I think Christianity, I think faith is never more important in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, good on him. And by the way, it's Christmas coming up in two days' time, just to remind everybody and uh, a time to really get out there. And it's about all the things that Christmas is about. Uh, well, I don't know about you, uh, Anthony, but, but for me, Christmas is, is often about large, copious amounts of very fine wine. I mean, are you, are you anything of a wine connoisseur yourself? I mean, have you noticed that it has been a record year for British winemakers? It Italy, France has suffered with the weather in the summer. Uh, we have not. Absolutely amazing. I'll be going to Midnight Mass at Epsom College uh, to, to, to get into it. But you have here the only two people in London who don't drink wine. We're... we're Non-alcohol at the moment, but what a great thing though! English, <laughs> English wine it's all making. For you, Neil. I mean, all I mean, for you. we we need to have more, many more, you know, trades and things starting up all over the country. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, here's an idea. What about 
What about Scotch studying in Scotland? I mean, that, I mean, that would be great. <laughs> give, one, give one for the next year. Yeah. Uh, do you know what? Do you know, I, I, I need a drink. I know someone else who needs a drink. Baroness Michelle Moan. She has certainly mm. seen better weeks. Um, uh, the Tory peer facing calls to be barred from the House of Lords after she admitted lying to journalists over claims she stood to benefit from £60 million over a PPE contract signed at the height of the COVID crisis. She's now insisting that the Prime Minister knew about her involvement in the contract from the beginning. Anthony, I'm, I'm going to say that there are some interviews that, you know, if I had been advising people, <laughs> I might not have suggested going ahead. Prince Andrew and Michelle Moan and her husband sitting down to admit that they were liars about the whole matter. What do you make of it? Good name for her, isn't it? Mm. And I think, look, if you accept becoming a member of the House of Lords, you have a duty to provide leadership. And it's, Absolutely. it's not about you and it's not about your 60 million quid. It's about the example that, that you're giving. And what is she doing for other people? Um, I well, think she's, poor, she says poor. she was defending her family, that, that, that she, was, oh, she yeah. lied about okay, her involvement okay, in a profitable okay. company but, to but, protect her but family. But I'm sorry, if you become a member of the legislature yeah. of this country, we were talking about how democracy is under fire all around the world. You have an example to, to really try and serve other people, not serve your bank balance. Mm, I agree. Um, Ria, um, being involved in a bloody conflict with Ukraine in the bleak midwinter, now that would make any week a bad week for the Russian army, mm. but it's an issue with rodents that has made things decidedly worse for them. Yes, they, I'm afraid they're suffering with mouse fever, a hantavirus, which is when you come into close contact with, with rodents, and particularly the, the feces. And of course, they're living in very poor conditions. And so they've had an outbreak of mouse fever, but they're denying it. They're denying it. They think the higher ups in the Russian army are saying, no, this is just an excuse not to not to hit the go to the front lines. But it can be quite severe and it's very unpleasant. But it sounds absolutely horrible. So, so what, what does it do to you? This, this well, uh, so it is a viral, viral infection, mm -hmm. um, vomiting multiple times a day, rashes, high fever. Uh, bleeding from the eyes. Bleeding from the eyes. Yeah, eye hemorrhaging. Dear so it's goodness. it's not pleasant at all. Well, I think we can say that the Russian army certainly is on the naughty list this year. So you know maybe that's that's a way of dealing with it. Um, Anthony, can can you talk to us though about about Ofsted? I mean, this week this was an interesting one. The story we've we, we've covered in some depth here on Sky News. The, the coroner from the Ruth Perry inquest uh, told the school's inspectorate that they must show they've taken steps to guard against the risk of of future teacher deaths and following a very, you know, tragic suicide. I mean, it is a very, very difficult thing when the inspectors turn up at your school, but it's... Can it's... we be really, really clear about this? Mm -hmm. I mean, teaching and schools should be about joy. Exactly. Or they're about nothing. And if the body that oversees the standards of schools is implanting fear, as Ofsted does into the hearts of head teachers and teachers and parents and kids the country over, it's not doing its job. It's about... It's about joy, it's about curiosity, it's about developing. I mean, the word education means leading out. Does anyone in Ofsted know what the word actually means? We've got to have a better system, and whoever wins the general election, let's have a, a, an education system that, that brings out the best of young people, doesn't fail. You know, one third of young people who are already the most disadvantaged in this country are failed at GCSE, told their failures. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we let's get joy, let's get... Let, let's get excitement, passion back into education. It's the best thing in for in the country. You, this is this is we've got we've got, we've got twenty we've got twenty seconds left. So I, I'm going to give you I'm gonna give you this to you, Anthony, because you have mentioned this quite a few times on the program. What is it? What is it about teaching that it, that has held your love and affection for 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 so long? Because kids are endlessly funny and fascinating and fresh and and you get and, to give and, them back and, 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 and delight when the bell rings as well and and, 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 and delightful and, the, and, and they're the future i mean how do we not see the common sense of making sure that our future is as happy and healthy as possible i certainly can it's a very good point um guys i have to say thank you so much uh, for your company this evening uh anthony we i'm just going to see if we can get this shot in <laughs> just before the end here uh, well, well, well thank you because my this, wife's already given me a hard time about the my chinos most beautiful uh, socks that uh, i have these ever seen are, are there and Rhea, of course dressed in, in very festive green as well guys uh, wishing you and yours um all the best for 2024 and a very merry christmas when it comes thanks for being with us you too thank you uh, stay right where you are. Coming up next on Friday Night with me, uh, we will be joined in the studio by the comedian Maisie Adam, who's getting ready to start in some absolute crackers this Christmas. That's next.
Now, if you've not seen our next guest on your TV over the past 12 months, you definitely will over the festive period. Her award-winning comedy has featured on Live at the Apollo, and she's a regular panellist on Have I Got News For You, Mock the Week, and A League of Their Own. Now, Maisie Adam is back with two absolute crackers over Christmas and New Year on Sky, the unofficial science of Die Hard and Indiana Jones, as well as sport's funniest moments with the brilliant Greg James. Maisie, lovely to have you in the studio. Thanks um, for having us. Are, you, are, are you excited by this time of year? I love I, it. Yeah. 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 I, I love this time of year, but I really love it now where I'm done with, <laughs> um, especially at Christmas gigs uh, and Christmas parties. Um, You're not telling me they can be boisterous. Now. Um, boisterous is polite, feral is accurate. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm very uh, happy to be the other side of the office Christmas party season. Yeah. Good. Yeah. But it's, it's not to say that you haven't put the work in during the year, and a couple of the programmes that are coming up this year, I have to say, I've already set my skybox to record. Oh, fantastic. Let's, let's start with the one which I will, I will admit has interests me the most because I am a complete fan of the series up to the third episode. The Unofficial <laughs> Science of Indiana Jones. Oh, are you a big indie Fan. I am a huge, but why not? I mean, and I associate them yeah. so much with this time of year mm -hmm. as well. So tell me about the program. Uh, so essentially, this is this has been one of those jobs where you can't quite believe it's a day at work <laughs> because essentially, what my task was uh, was myself and Greg James had to test if the stunts done in the Indiana Jones films would hold up in real life. Mm. Yeah, so that's where the unofficial science comes in. So it's essentially me and Greg James out running a boulder, uh, doing the mine cart, uh, using a whip to get us, yourself across a big chasm. Um, you're all in a day's work, you know, just a, a normal day at the office. Well, do you know what? Let's, you, mentioned, you mentioned the whipping. Uh, oh, that, yeah. uh, that handily is the clip that we've got, so let's take a very quick let's, look. Let's do it. Goggles on, please, Maisie. In the wrong hands, a whip can be very dangerous. I really hope these aren't the wrong hands. Let the whipping commence. Ah! Not as easy as it looks. I don't think she's making it look that easy. Stop. The world is whipping, then have some whip cracks. Hear that sound? Sonic boom. Mini sonic boom. First man-made object to break the sound barrier. That's really cool. Man-made, but in the hands of a woman, Zoe. <laughs> I became someone I didn't realise mm. uh, with, with that whip. Um, I, it may surprise you to know, but I'm not. I'm not normally found with a whip in hand. I was going to ask. No, it's it, not. It didn't look like you were. You were no. entirely au fait with that. No, as a, as no. A... Me and me and the whip. That was the first time we'd met. I'll be honest <laughs> with you. Um, and it was uh, it was terrifying and thrilling. Uh, and one of the most bizarre jobs I've done in comedy uh, yeah. to date, I yeah. think. But so much fun. I don't, I don't, I don't. Obviously, don't want any spoilers. But but just just reassure me that you didn't end up at the bottom of a bottomless chasm. No. Uh, as a result no, of I the managed to I managed to, to to well, thanks to our the help of our scientist Zoe, who you saw in that clip, uh, we managed to work out a way in which you can get across a chasm. Uh, she had a, a, a solution for everything, quicksand. Mm. I mean, we all remember how scared we were of quicksand growing up. 100%. Then, uh, it's the worst thing uh, in the world. Yeah, and then you don't really encounter it half as much as you, you think you're going to. Um, but uh, I, I've always been intrigued to know what it's like, and now I know. I've mm. been in quicksand with Greg James. How many people can say they've done that? You have also been in Sports Funniest 2023 oh. with Greg James as well. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it, whatever is your sport, it's been a year for mm. it, hasn't it? We've had so much to talk about. We've had, obviously, the Women's World Cup. We've had uh, the uh, controversy of the Ashes. Just a little bit. I think people are still getting over that. Well, uh, some, some of it's not so fast. Well, yeah, so, some of you, I'm you. sure, we're just happy to watch <laughs> England spit the dummies out. I've seen anything. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, we covered loads of stuff. Obviously, Man City winning the treble. There's been a big year with boxing, crossover boxing. Uh, it's it's been a, a, a mad a mad time. We've had we covered darts, we've covered golf. There was so much to talk about. Um, I'm a massive sports fan, and as I say, regardless of what your favourite sport is, um, it was definitely uh, this is a show for you because there was a lot to unpack. And you you you, you certainly got stuck in. Uh, oh yeah. For, for this, it's out on the 27th of December. Um, penalty taking. We have a clip of oh, you and Greg with the sensational Chloe Kelly putting, putting the balls in the back of the poker. Oh. Let's have a look. Here we go. Okay, Maisie, I think you should go first. Final words of advice, please, for Maisie. Just breathe. 
Nice. Oh, 76, so though. So. Quick. Love it. Quick. Shall I go? Yeah, you go. Shall I do your one from the quarters and get it top left? That would be lovely. That was that was that was your more stereotypical English penalty yeah, just at the end there, almost straight over the bar. Some say Greg's is still landing. Um, <laughs> were you, were you, are you a footballer then? Yeah, yeah. I love football yeah. and I've I've played it my whole life and still mm. play it sort of you know in a little in a little league. Um, and I, I have to say, I was trying to come across all cool and, you know, oh hi Chloe. I felt like a kid who'd won a competition. Oh, yeah. I did. She was so effortlessly cool and. I, don't, I think we've spoken about this several times, but Chloe Kelly's uh, penalty in, mm. in that Women's World Cup, in the shootout, 69 miles per hour, right? That was more powerful than any penalty we had in the entire Premier League. The woman's a machine. So I was really, really feeling the, um, the pressure to impress. Mm. Uh, and I did all right, as you saw there. Thank you for showing, I, no, thank you for showing one of the good ones. I thought that was, I thought that was remarkable, you know. <laughs> it was great. Only, only because, I, I mean, I, it, I'm very much of the topoke You're kind more of a school Greg. of football. You're yeah, more exactly. of a Greg. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's I have to say, I love Greg and I've loved working with him. I hadn't really... We hadn't worked together much at all and then suddenly we had these two jobs together. Uh, he's a wonderful person, uh, but a terrible, terrible footballer. Um, just as we... Obviously, it's this time of year. We're, we're heading into to Christmas and, of yeah. course, the Science of Indiana Jones out on New Year's Day. Sports funniest out on the 27th of December. Just just looking back on your 2023, I mean, yeah. how has it been? We've all had a bit of a roller coaster, it I think, has, emotionally. It? Yeah, it's been one... It, it's 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 definitely been a, a roller coaster mm. year, for sure. Like, um, highlight would be going to Australia for the World Cup. Brilliant. Loved that. Low light would be um, losing the World Cup <laughs> in Australia. So even even my August alone was just sort of a a, a, a roller coaster in itself. Um, I got married this summer, and then the next day played soccer aid. Um, so that was a roller coaster, <laughs> if just for my um, belly. I think. <laughs> I can imagine. Uh, yeah, trying to trying to trying to play football on the world stage with uh, with Usain Bolt and Roberta Carlos, and you're going. Just, just Not don't bad. throw up all that prosecco from last night, Mays. Just, just don't <laughs> do that live on air. Um, it's, it's been an, an unreal year. Yeah. Uh, so it's, 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 it's been fun to do shows like this that have been so yeah. celebratory, and Good. especially the sports one has been, you know, so much to talk about. And, uh, and hopefully it'll be just as jam packed with drama next year. Um, well, Maisie, look, it's been a, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank well, I you. wish you and your family a very merry Christmas when and it you comes. Too. And and look, all the very best for twenty twenty four. Thank you, thank you. We're going to take a short break. Coming up next in the sport, more silverware for Manchester City and Pep Guardiola as they are crowned FIFA Club World Cup champions in Saudi Arabia. New Year, bringing with it new hope. This is incredible. That's what I like about it. Give us a song then, Rod. <laughs> Good news, it's not extinct. To start planting a whole new rainforest. Too heartwarming to help others. India, the first to land south of the moon. The lonelier sheep has been rescued. Love it, did amazing. Best story of the day. The saying, I've, so I've got a diamond break on my own alone. phone. News never stops. <laughs> We've done nearly 9,000 hours of rescue this year. Um, and we're an all-volunteer team, so that puts quite a strain on all our team members. Um, so, yeah, we're looking at ways of reducing that number and keeping people safe on the hills. It has been tracking the number of visitors in the last few years. This increase over the last year, we don't really have enough data as to, to why that sudden increase of 25%, but generally... We, Snowdonia is getting a lot more visitors and that just reflected in the, uh, the amount of rescues that we're carrying out. If they're on the mountain, they're part of you know, the mountain community, um, even if it is just their first time, and we will step in and help out. Um, but we are looking at other agencies as well, working with other agencies to maybe see if we can do something to re reduce the sort of the low level rescues that we have to carry out as well. People who are not mountain aware don't realise the change in the weather from down in the valley 
to the summit and back again and how that can change, not just with the altitude, but during the day. So you could start off on a nice sunny winter's day and by three or four o'clock, it's getting dark. The weather's closed in. You can't see where you're going and suddenly it's sleeting and snowing. Um, and yeah, that can make a big impact on people's confidence and their ability to get off the mountain. We don't advise people not to go in the mountains. We don't see ourselves as gatekeepers. Um, the mountains are a great place to get fit. Um, it's acknowledged that spending time outdoors is great for your mental health. So we're certainly not gatekeepers. We just want people to ask some very simple questions about, do I know where I'm going, what I'm doing? Have I got a plan for the day? Have I got a plan B for the day? Um, do I know what the weather's doing? Not just what it looks like outside when I start, but what's the weather planning to do? Uh, bearing in mind that the mountain weather can be pretty unpredictable. And finally, do I have the right gear? And if you ask yourself all these questions and you find some of them are, you're not sure, then see what you can do to address it or come up with a different plan. Welcome back to Friday night. Time for the sport. And Pep Guardiola and Manchester City are the FIFA Club World Cup winners after a 4-0 win over the South American champions, Fluminense of Brazil. Chris Latcham from Sky Sports News is here to correct me on my pronunciation of that well-known South American team. Actually, do you know what? It's Christmas. It's Christmas, Chris. So confession time. I didn't even know that the World Club Cup was going on at the moment. Is it a big thing? Uh, I suppose it depends who you ask. If you ask fans of uh, clubs that aren't there, absolutely not. No, it doesn't matter. I don't know why you'd be bothered, but if you're a Manchester City fan this evening, probably matters a bit. If you're Pep Guardiola, I imagine it matters a lot. He's now won it four times, having won it three times before with his great Barcelona team of the turn of the previous decades, around 2009, 10, 11. Uh, and they were absolutely brilliant. A cut above. Fluminense is the way that we're pronouncing it here at Thank Sky you. Sports News, Neil. Just to correct you there at this uh, wonderful time of year. City were utterly dominant in this game. I think we can show you the goals. And it's actually one of their South American stars who scored two. That's Nathan Ake, Dutchman, hitting the post. And Julian Alvarez, Oof. the Argentine World Cup winner, somehow stooping to chest the ball over the line for 1-0 in the first minute of the game. That was in... 40 seconds he turned that one in. City was soon 2 up. This is Phil Foden forcing the own goal uh, halfway through the first half. So at that point, it looked like it was all done. Into the second half, Phil Foden not happy with just creating an own goal for the Brazilians to score for City. He got in on the act uh, himself. Uh, if, and then that is the fourth goal. Really nice goal. Alvarez completing the set. And what a year he has had. This time last year, Alvarez was winning the World Cup with Argentina. And then he's gone on this merry run with Manchester City and winning five trophies. Those five trophies, the English Premier League, the European Champions League, the FA Cup, the European Super Cup. And there you can see they're lifting the club World Cup. And you ask any of those players on that podium right there, Neil, I think they'll say, yeah, it matters quite a lot but actually yeah. now immediately they'll flip their focus back to the Premier League because they've been missing while their opponents have been playing and the gap at the top of the league after a pretty patchy form in England for Manchester City means they're a little bit off the pace. Uh, Celtic's invite must have been lost in the post. Um, Chris, <laughs> whilst we've got you, let's cross the city. Manchester United, uh, briefly if you can, because we've only got about 20 seconds, just what are we looking out for? There could be an announcement at, at forthcoming at nine o'clock. We're expecting a statement. Now, social media will have you believe that that has to be confirmation that Jim Ratcliffe, who owns the Ineos petrochemicals firm, it's confirmation of his uh, massive money investment in the club, not takeover, investment. He wants 25%. He wants control of the football side of things. We don't know exactly what the statement is yet, Neil, so we're going to have to wait and see on that one. Uh, how about you take us through the rest of the sport then, Chris? Thanks. The Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with vitality. I love this country. Ajin, thanks for letting us share your match day experience. You've just landed at Humberside Airport. Yeah. Tell us about your day so far. 
Actually, <laughs> my day is a little strange uh, because uh, Turkey doesn't use uh, summer time. I have a big advantage in flying to England because I almost land in the time I start the journey. Then for me, the plane is like a bed. And it's very important for you that you're here to yeah. attend the games for Hull City, especially with the team going so well. Only game I missed this season actually uh, was the game uh, the president's brother's uh, son was getting married. So uh, I had to attend in that merit. Apart from that, uh, I've been all the games home and I can see that half of the games away. So we've got a busy day yeah. ahead of us and I think the next stop is the, the club store to meet some of the fans. Let's yeah. go and meet the fans then. Yeah. Born and raised in Hull. In, in Hull, yeah. yeah. Grandfather Hull, everybody Hull. But his dad supports Leeds United. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. How important is it for you to have this interaction with the fans? Because when you took over, you made it clear that yeah. the fans were a, a big part of the project for you. Actually, our average attendance was 8,000 uh, when uh, we were buying the club. So uh, 8,000 was not a good number uh, for a beautiful club like this. So we were dreaming to, to make it 15,000, 14, 15,000. Now we have the 20,000 average. So I can see that it's more than the dream. Uh, I'm so happy that the fans are now back to the stadiums and back to the stores. So uh, football is nothing without fans. So our fans, by the way, are always, you can see today, uh, energy. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Chris, thanks very much. Let's see how the weather is looking as we head into Christmas. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. At this stage, it looks as though only parts of the north will see a white Christmas as conditions remain mostly mild and windy in the run-up to the 25th. Uh, as for this evening, uh, the rain spreading north will become heavier, with snow likely in the northeast, where a few centimetres of lying snow are possible, even to lower levels. Elsewhere, it will be mild, but windy, with localised gales. Western upslopes will see a few outbreaks of light rain or drizzle. The snow showers uh, will ease over Shetland tomorrow, uh, Rain over Scotland will spread back into Northern Ireland and Northern England. The colder air to the north is likely to give a spell of snow or freezing rain for Northern Scotland. For the rest of the country, though, it will be mostly dry away from the western areas where, I'm afraid to say, there will be ongoing rain or drizzle. Uh, central, southern and southeastern areas most likely to stay dry with some bright or sunny spells. Temperatures, well, as you can see, they will reach double figures away from the chilly north, uh, but it certainly won't feel mild in those strong winds. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Coming up in the final hour of the final Friday night with Neil Patterson of 2023, we will bring you more on the UN Security Council finally agreeing a resolution to get aid into Gaza. But what difference, if any, will it make on the ground? In contra. Against. 2023, New Year, bringing with it new hope. This is incredible. That's what I like about it. Give us a song then, Rod. <laughs> Good news, it's not extinct. To start planting a whole new rainforest. Three heartwarming to help others. India, the first to land south of the moon. The lonelier sheep has been rescued. Love it, did amazing. Best story of the day. The same, I'm sorry, I've got a sky news break on my own.
It's Friday the 22nd of December. Welcome back to Friday Night with me, Neil Patterson. Uh, let's run you through the headlines as we have them. After days of heavy negotiation, the United States backs a watered-down UN resolution to increase humanitarian aid for Gaza. Police launch a criminal investigation into the alleged abduction of Alex Bathy, who went missing six years ago whilst on holiday in Spain, aged 11. Traffic jams, cancelled trains and millions making the Christmas getaway. But drivers are warned to leave it late if they want to avoid the queues. And Wham! has topped the charts at Christmas for the first time, almost 40 years after their festive hit was first released. Now, Christmas wouldn't be Christmas without a few good films to watch. Fancy giving Ferrari a go? Our film critic Anna Smith will be joining us to discuss the performance of the appropriately named leading man, Adam Driver. And we will be answering the ultimate question definitively, once and for all, forever, is Die Hard a Christmas film? The answer is yes, of course it is. Uh, great to have your company. We are here for another hour. Hold on tight. It's Friday night. Evening all. Uh, we begin in New York, where after long days and nights of negotiations to avoid a US veto, the UN Security Council has voted in favour of a new resolution to increase aid into Gaza. But the resolution does not call for a ceasefire. Instead, the language has been watered down and calls to create conditions for a sustainable cessation of hostilities. It also requests the United Nations Secretary General to appoint a humanitarian coordinator to oversee and speed up the delivery of aid into the territory. Sky's Nicole Johnston has much more. Jabalia refugee camp in North Gaza, where the war never seems to end. Israel has been dropping bombs here for weeks. This woman keeps saying, they bombed us, they bombed us. Look, this is my uncle Salem. Record this, let people see. There's no dignity in a death like this. These men say more bodies are buried under the rubble. The UN says nowhere is safe. And across Gaza, desperate demand for food, water and medicine. It's hard to find and costs a fortune. I go to the market looking for canned food, but where do I get the money to buy it? The Israelis forced us from one place to another and now I can't survive. I can't get food for my children. But on the edge of Gaza, a small sign of hope. Israel's Kerem Shalom border crossing. Aid trucks are now entering from here dozens a day. But Hamas says this week Israeli forces killed the head of the crossing on the Gaza side in an airstrike. The IDF attacked Hamas militants that came with weapons to our border. The IDF does everything in our power from one hand to uh, reach our objectives of demolishing the terror regime of Hamas while operating this large-scale humanitarian operation. But to Gazans, this isn't enough. They want Karim Shalom crossing fully opened. It is the main commercial crossing into Gaza. It's the only one that can take hundreds and thousands of trucks into Gaza to try and help the situation there. Help must come fast. But diplomats have dithered. After a week of debate, the UN Security Council has finally passed a resolution to increase aid to Gaza, but not to end the war. Today, this council called for urgent steps to immediately allow safe, unhindered and expanded humanitarian access and to create the conditions for a sustainable cessation of hostilities. It's not far enough for the UN Secretary General. A humanitarian ceasefire 
is the only way to begin to meet the desperate needs of people in Gaza and end their ongoing nightmare. Back in Gaza, people wait for food. They wait for the war to end. And the longer it drags on, the more they lose hope. Nicole Johnston, Sky News, Jerusalem. Well, let's bring in our US correspondent, Mark Stone, joining us from Washington, monitoring events, of course, at the UN Security Council uh, in New York. I mean, Mark, allow me to be a professional cynic here, just, just for a couple of moments. Great that this resolution has been passed. It's been welcomed, certainly, in the region, particularly by those who, who want to see, you know, an end to the deaths of civilians in this particular conflict. But to what extent does it actually compel Israel to do what it says? You know, could they keep the doors shut if they wanted to? Yes, uh, they could. Uh, and remember that Israel's relationship uh, with the United Nations is, um, as a body uh, is not good. Uh, mm. it, it was only a few weeks ago that they revoked the visa of, uh, of a very senior, or didn't renew, I should say, the visa of a very senior UN uh, official uh, in uh, Jerusalem, Lynn Hastings, uh, who has in, in the past uh, few weeks before that visa was re revoked, uh, she was trying to do what they are now calling for a new person to do, uh, and that is to be a coordinator to help uh, get aid into Gaza. She's now out of Israel because her visa ran out. They didn't give her a new one. Uh, that gives you an assessment or, or a sense of, uh, of the relationship between the United Nations as a body uh, and Israel. Um, that said, the fact that the Americans um, are on board with this resolution, which doesn't call for a ceasefire, and that's why they're on board, uh, it, uh, that suggests that Israel will be, um, will be cooperative uh, because uh, the, the Israelis and the Americans are so close. Again, Mark, just, just explain why. Because I, mean, I, I understand there will be people who will be watching this evening and go, OK, sustainable cessation of hostilities on this hand, you know, ceasefire on the other. What is the difference? Why does the language matter? Uh, it matters because um, in diplomacy, uh, in order to get something across the line, you need to get everyone on side. Otherwise, there'll be no resolution at all. Um, in terms of the difference, well, the, the Americans and, and actually the Brits and others uh, who have since shifted, uh, they were of the view, they were all of the view, now just the Americans are still of the view, uh, that if you have an immediate ceasefire now, uh, that uh, does not help Israel to defend itself against Hamas. And remember that Hamas rockets are still, remarkable as it may be, given uh, how much um, uh, bombing there has been, Israeli bombing of Gaza, Hamas is still capable of firing rockets at Israel. Um, these rockets are, are frightening for, for Israelis. They are not causing casualties, anything like uh, the casualties that we're seeing uh, in Israel. In fact, I don't, I'm not aware of, of any Israelis having been killed by these rockets uh, in recent weeks. Um, but if you have an immediate ceasefire, the view of the Americans is uh, that benefits Hamas. They are unable to regroup, the status quo remains, uh, and we are back in a situation where Hamas is in control of Gaza, and they could repeat uh, what they did uh, back in October again and again. And elements of Hamas have said, senior officials in Hamas have said that they would like to repeat October the 7th again and again and again. So that's why a ceasefire uh, is not something that could pass, which is why that the diplomats are around that Security Council, the top chamber of the, of the UN, have, have had to sort of put this, the word ceasefire to one side and come up with something different, uh, which uh, is addressing a, a, an absolutely urgent need now, which is, which is the, um, uh, to get aid into Gaza in quantity. But, you know, you can, to, to, to be cynical uh, as your question was, it's true. I mean, it's taken them, what, 11 weeks to come up mm. with a form of words and all it actually does is increase the amount of aid that's getting into Gaza. I mean, that's not, that's a pretty damning assessment of what the world's top diplomats are able to do. Yeah, and, and, and as you just mentioned there, Mark, the fact is the situation on the ground is getting progressively worse in the south of Gaza. We even heard talk at the Security Council today that famine could be on the way. 
not just the south of Gaza, all over Gaza. Of course, yeah. Nowhere is safe, and that is, that is clear. When I was there uh, um, three weeks ago or so, um, it, it was uh, they were busy. The Israelis and the Americans were telling people to move to the south of Gaza where they would be safe. And it has been evident again and again and again that they're not safe in the south of Gaza because the bombing is, is happening there uh, as well. Uh, that's the primary um, uh, challenge uh, and the, the primary focus over the past however many weeks it's been has been the deaths, 20,000 people now dead, a Hamas... Um, uh, health ministry figure, but it's one that previous conflicts have have said have suggested is accurate. Uh, the Americans, uh, even they, are admitting now that the the figure is accurate. It is likely to be twenty thousand. Behind that primary challenge are, are secondary uh, and tertiary challenges of of the injured, how they can be treated in hospitals that aren't functioning. Imagine, for example, um, twenty thousand dead. I was talking to a, a prosthetist the other day who, who here in Washington who who deals with prosthetics in war. Uh, he's not dealing with it with the Israel-Gaza war, but in previous conflicts, whether it's, be, whether it's Ukraine ongoing or, or the Iraq or Afghanistan wars, he's dealt with, with people who've lost limbs. And he says that if you, you can times by three the number who've probably lost limbs compared with those who've died. So you're looking maybe, I mean, a staggering number of, of people who have lost limbs who will need ongoing care that they cannot receive. So that's one example of, of the challenges that, in, that, that are, the Gazans are, are now facing. And then, of course, there's, there's, there's food and, and supplies. Um, the UAE uh, ambassador said today in the chamber of the UN, let's be clear, unless we take drastic action, there will be famine in Gaza. That's the first time I've heard that, the word famine uh, being used. But, but it is the view of the World Health Programme at the moment that half of the population of Gaza is now starving. Uh, and that will quite quickly uh, become famine uh, if aid is not got in in, in, in big numbers. And that, that is clearly what this resolution uh, is about. It, it is about trying to get uh, a lot more aid in, into the, uh, the strip. Uh, and the way to do that is to have a coordinator, they believe, a UN figure. Well, let's see what happens next. Mark, for now, thanks very much indeed. Now, a criminal investigation has been launched into the alleged abduction of Alex Batty, six years after he went missing in Spain. The teenager who left the Pyrenees by flagging down a van driver has described wanting to leave his nomadic lifestyle. Alex Batty was just 11 when he left the UK with mother and grandfather, but they were not his legal guardians, as Sadia Chowdhury reports. 2,269 days missing. But in a note left behind for his mum, Alex doesn't say why he finally fled. Instead, the boy, now 17, told a newspaper harsh living conditions drove him to escape. It was a lot of construction work, demolition work, um, decoration work, painting walls, renovation work. I had a non-existent social life, to be honest. I would... Um, as much as I could, I'd try and play uh, video games online because I had a couple online friends, but, you know, you can't really class them as friends, can you? Alex Batty was 11 when he and his mother went missing. Last week, he left in an escape, now making headlines. His unbelievable journey, now followed by an unbelievable reality. Being back with my grandma feels quite surreal. Every time I go to sleep, I feel like I'm going to be waking up back in France. It's not really kicked in yet that, that I am back in England. And back in his previous hometown of Manchester, police there have spoken to him. Alex's disappearance is now the subject of a criminal investigation launched by Greater Manchester Police. The first step in the case actually coming to criminal courts with Alex's mother coming back to this country and that would have to be through extradition. It's only a criminal offence if Alex was actually removed from this country without consent of his grandmother. Um, it wouldn't actually be a criminal offence if, as we've read, this was an, a pre-arranged holiday agreed with the grandmother. Alex's great escape is beginning to sound not so great. He's admitted making up dramatic stories about his journey so police wouldn't find his mother. If she's watching, he wants her to know this. I tell him I love him. I tell him I'm sorry for leaving, but it was necessary for my future. Um, all's good. 
happy, very happy actually. Um, healthy, you know I love the cold, so <laughs> we've got, I've got that again. Um, that's it really. You know I can take care of myself, so you don't have to worry about any of that. The teenager says he now wants to focus on his future. Dreams and ambitions, he says, worth leaving home for. Sadia Chowdhury, Sky News. And you have to imagine that that story is going to be featuring in a number of tomorrow's papers. We've got our extended press preview and news review from half past ten this evening. Anna Botting will be joined by the parliamentary sketch writer at The Daily Telegraph, Madeleine Grant, and the broadcaster and commentator, Alex Andrea. Police in Prague have released body cam footage of the moment officers stormed a university during their response to a mass shooting. The footage shows armed officers entering a building and members of the public fleeing Charles University yesterday. The gunman, named in Czech media as 24-year-old David Kozak, opened fire in the philosophy department. Our Europe correspondent Adam Parsons reports from Prague. These are the scenes as police in Prague pursue a gunman who has launched a horrific killing spree. We've had information that he's on the roof, says this officer. David Kozak is on the balcony and he's firing shots. The police are moving up the building and they go out onto the balcony. They find the gunman has killed himself. Nearby, urgent medical attention. An officer wants tourniquets to treat life-threatening wounds. Among the victims, Lenka Levkova, a professor, and Lucy Spindlerova, who was a student. Sergei Medvedev was laying flowers today. A professor at the university, he heard the shooting during his lecture and then helped his students to build a barricade. So we blocked ourselves uh, inside the auditorium. We took all the desks and chairs towards the door, so we blocked the door entrance. I locked the door. An hour later, um, the special forces uh, broke in for the second time, then lay us all on the floor. And then they took us out uh, of the building, um, and as we walked uh, down the stairs, there was blood all over the place. There was uh, blood on the stairs, blood on the steps. Kozak was 24, a history student with no criminal record but he had built up a cache of weapons and ammunition. His attack forcing some people to take desperate measures to avoid being caught, while others were rushed out in a bewildered crowd. And Kozak is now being linked to the murder of his own father and to this, the killing of a man and his baby last week. There are relevant indicators and clues that suggest that the same offender was responsible for all three of these incidents. The police have already arrested at least one person who claimed he wanted to emulate the massacre. People here are anxious. The police say they're stepping up their profile to calm nerves. This is a city and a country in a state of trauma. At these impromptu memorials, you see tears, but what you hear is silence. But these people know that this dreadful massacre could have been even worse. When the gunman died, he still had a huge supply of unused ammunition. This is a city with a low crime rate. Kozak's brutal, callous killing spree has come as a devastating shock. Adam Parsons, Sky News, Prague. The economy flatlines in the third quarter of this year, prompting fears that the UK may soon fall into recession. The Office for National Statistics says that GDP contracted by 0.1% between July and September and growth of 0.2% in the second quarter of the year has also been revised down to zero. Our business correspondent Paul Kelso has been speaking to folks in Bristol. If you can't celebrate this weekend, you never will and Christmas has delivered the seasonal shop this Bristol restaurant has been waiting for after another very trying year. 
in places it's, it's been amazing and in certain places it's been ooh, you know this is uh, a little bit a little bit sketchy here and there it's the back end that people don't see you know the back of house it's the you know rising utilities it's the energy costs you know obviously it's the kind of staff costs which is also going up it's something you can't paint a picture for guests it's a recipe for hard work that's been repeated across an economy that's performing even worse than we thought New data from the Office for National Statistics has revised down growth for the second and third quarters of the year. Growth of 0.2% in quarter two reduced to zero and in quarter three from flatlining to minus 0.1. These are small margins but they put the UK on the brink of a technical recession and the Prime Minister who pledged to deliver growth on the defensive. Compared to the predictions at the beginning of the year, the economy has done better and we've actually grown faster than our European neighbours like Germany, for example. Uh, but of course we want to see more growth. Christmas has also come to the rescue for retailers in Bristol's arcade. Small businesses who've spent the year battling inflation. Just like their customers. I try to plan forward in advance so I'm already considering next year's wage increase. Um, so I need to adjust the hours of the shop, maybe open a bit longer to get more sales in. When the system slams you with big energy costs, high is the interest rate, rents go up. Come on, anyone can see what they're doing to the people, innit? Even in tough times, we make an exception for spending at Christmas, but economically, it feels like the hangover has come early. In truth, we'd expect the economy to slow with interest rates rising. And if there is something under the tree, it's that inflation is falling faster than expected. So this may not last quite as long. <laughs> the experts know you can't keep everyone happy at Christmas. There we go. Come January, belt tightening may be less a New Year resolution than a necessity. Merry Christmas. Paul Kelso, Sky News in Bristol. You're watching Friday Night here on Sky News. Coming up next, are you driving home for Christmas? Are you toe-to-toe -to -toe in tailbacks, red lights all around? Don't worry, we will tell you exactly how the great Christmas getaway is going. Martin Brunt and I'm Sky's crime correspondent. My most memorable story was and still is the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. Please, please do not hurt her. Please give our little girl back. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. For detectives, the first 48 hours after a murder are crucial in the search for clues. The public expects them to find Jill Dando's killer soon. The British detectives are planning to meet forensic experts, academics and even witch doctors. I remember the grimmest case, the Soham murders of schoolgirls Holly and Jessica. I felt I can't undo what's happened, but I can help explain it. Ian Huntley was arrested and charged within a fortnight of the murders. I've never murdered anyone. I've never raped anyone. What am I in jail for? The parole board has to decide if Bronson needs to be kept locked up for the safety of the public. My biggest challenge was to persuade a jail diamond thief to answer my letters. Martin Brunt, Sky News, at the Old Bailey. Five of us have made it out of the car. Well, 
welcome to Backstage, the film and TV podcast. Welcome back to Friday nights. Now, have you decided to delay your tri Christmas travel plans or even stay at home? A combination of the weather, traffic snarl-ups and problems on the rail network, it's all doing its best to make travelling as arduous as possible. Rail operators say that tonight and tomorrow there will be the busiest times to travel before Christmas. On the roads, the RAC estimates that 13.5 million journeys will take place in Britain this weekend. That's up 20% on last year. Sky's Becky Cottrell has the latest. Kicking off the holidays by getting in the car. Millions making festive trips to join family and friends. But today had all the ingredients for travel chaos, with many people finishing work or school and hitting the road. It's been um, busier than we anticipated. We were quite pleased this morning. We had um, a, a, you know, a, a bit of an uplift around about six, seven, eight o'clock. And we think that's probably people taking our advice and uh, doing some of the longer journeys, getting that part underway early on. National Highways has removed more than a thousand miles of roadworks on England's motorways to help ease congestion. But at Dover, car and lorry drivers faced long queues following strikes by French workers. As for those travelling in electric vehicles, there were fears following queues like this at charging stations last year. 2023 has been a, a really great year for EV charging, particularly the rollout of those rapid and ultra rapid chargers that EV drivers need when they're on longer journeys. And if you look at the numbers overall, there are 40 percent more units, devices in, in the ground than there were this time last year. And in fact, recently there was a milestone in the UK, 10,000 rapid or ultra rapid devices across 5,000 charging locations. And good news for many rail passengers, with the majority of services back up and running after havoc caused by Storm Pier. We actually managed to get to the station very early, so we're here an hour earlier than we would have been, so it's worked out OK. <laughs> this weekend could be even busier for travellers, particularly on the roads. The advice for those buying some last-minute gifts or trying to get away, get up nice and early or save your trip for later in the evening. Becky Cottrell, Sky News. Let's take a quick look at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. I'm afraid that at this stage, it looks as only parts of the north of the country will be seeing a white Christmas. Conditions remain mostly mild and windy in the run-up to the 25th. This evening, though, rain spreading north will become heavier, with snow likely in the northeast. A few centimetres of lying snow is possible, even at lower levels. Elsewhere, mild but windy with localised gales. Western upslopes will see a few outbreaks of light rain or drizzle. Snow showers will ease over Shetland tomorrow. Rain over Scotland will spread back into Northern Ireland and Northern England. The colder air to the north is likely to give a spell of snow or freezing rain for northern Scotland. For the rest of the country, mostly dry, away from those western areas. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Stay right where you are. Coming up next, we will be getting our Friday film fix, helping you decide what to watch in the cinemas and on TV over Christmas. I'll be joined once again in the studio by top film critic Anna Smith.
Uh, welcome back to Friday Night with me, Neil Patterson. And, of course, normally at this point in the show, we give you a few tips on what to watch this weekend. Well, not only are we going to go over some of the big film releases this week, it is Christmas, after all. Uh, so we're going to throw in a few of the festive favourites coming up on TV as well. Uh, joining us once again to take us through all of that, the brilliant film critic, fine host of the Girls on Film podcast, uh, Anna Smith. Anna, welcome back. Very good to see you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Sp sparkly earrings. Love Thank them. Um, should, we, should we start first with the, with the films that are out at the moment? And... Sweet Sue, tell, tell me about this, because an interesting choice to, to talk about at Christmas, given that it's been described to me as a tragic comedy. What's it all about? Well, it is a tragic comedy, but it's a very, very funny one. And what immediately interested me about this film is that it's made by Leo Lee, who happens to be Mike Lee's son. So Mike Lee, the director of mm. Secrets and Lies, very renowned. Oh, and I was a little bit nervous about watching this, you know, with those expectations in mind. But actually, Leo turns out to have a lot of his father's talent and is making that kind of lovely sort of kitchen sink, laugh-out-loud realism. Um, and this is a story of a woman who's back on the dating scene. Um, she meets a rather gruff biker at a funeral, very tragic comic place to meet. Um, and then she sort of meets his young son, who is an Instagrammer and a social media influencer. So you've got different generations, different sort of comedic possibilities. But should we have a look at the clip? Let's have a look. Got a lot going on. Kids' parties for you. You got kids? No. You can't do that in here. I'm at my little brother's funeral, so I wanted to vape. Do you want something to eat, Mum? No. Want me to go and get you something? Yeah. Do you know what, if, if you hadn't said that this was by Mike Lee's son, there is something about the visuals there that just took me back to some of his oeuvre. Definitely. The visuals, the music, the way they actually rehearse with the actors, a lot of it's based on improv originally by the actors. Maggie O'Neill's tremendous in the lead role there. And I was laughing out loud to the point where I was actually rewinding this at home to watch a scene again. Mm. I would say it's one of those films that is worth seeing for individual scenes that are very, very funny. Perhaps comes to a bit of a muted end. Don't expect any great resolution. Mm -hmm. No but, spoilers, please. Yeah, Thank you. But if you enjoy Mike Lee films and yeah. that kind of genre, definitely see it. It's in Curzon Cinemas and in Curzon and her cinema now. I might have a look at that in the new year. One that I am desperate to see, I have to admit, though, is, is Ferrari. Adam Driver, Penelope Cruz, fantastic actors, and what a story. Well, this is coming out on Boxing Day, and, yeah, Adam Driver is tremendous in the lead role here. He plays Enzo Ferrari in 1957, which was a momentous year in his life. Huge. Potentially facing bankruptcy, juggling a mistress and a wife, and, and you know, very many dramatic things happening on the racing scene. Um, should we have a look at a clip of that? Yeah, that's a look. Or a competitor. If you get into one of my cars, you get in the wind. It's slow. So, so who's, who's directed this one? I think this, this is Michael Mann. Ah, uh, of course. Yeah. No, I, I would more commonly associate him with the big blockbuster kind of, you know, Hollywood, you know, you, 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 Heat and so on and so forth. Yeah. This, I suppose, requires a bit more subtlety in part. Yeah, I would say it's more educational and impressive than it is entertaining. Uh -huh. It looks fantastic. I, I always like I always like to go and watch educational <laughs> films. Myself. I'm not selling it, am I? No. It looks fantastic. I mean, he is a tremendous filmmaker, and there are a couple of scenes mm. in this that visually are absolutely stunning, memorable. Um, but what he's done is really he's looking at quite the serious side of this man's life. Mm. It's not about the fun of racing in a way. It's a lot of it is about the risk mm. both he took in racing and in business and in his private life. So there is some peril there, um, but it's not perhaps as glamorous as you might think a Ferrari movie might be, but the period detail's fantastic. Penelope Cruz is amazing, the cast is fantastic. What, what was the film that came out before? That I was, um, was it Ford? Ford versus Ferrari. See, now that one, that would be my recommendation, because I yes. think that's fantastic. But of course, it's almost Christmas. We've got to talk Christmas movies and what's on the television at this time of year. Let's start with the perennial debate, Die Hard. It's on over Christmas this year. Is it or is it not a Christmas movie? What do you think? I think it's a Christmas movie if you want it to be a Christmas movie. I right? do. Yeah, I do. Then it is a Christmas, Christmas movie. movie. Because, you know, some people like a very cosy, easy watch that isn't particularly challenging. Whereas this one, as you know, mm. it, it has thrills and spills. Mm -hmm. You know, there is danger. Yippee um, but crying. also, it's happening over the Christmas period. There mm -hmm. are loads of references. His wife is named, my producer Joe told, pointed this out earlier, his wife's name is Holly. 
How much more Christmassy can you get? Good point. Mm. And a lot of people involved in the film have come out saying, yes, it's a Christmas movie. Um, I, I love the fact that people enjoy debating about this. Mm. It's a fun thing. I think for a certain generation, it's become the alternative Christmas movie, which yeah. is almost mainstream now. But it's always lovely to rewatch, isn't it? I just and it's and, and, it, and it is and it's, there's a kind of a, there is an added kind of sad dimension to all of this. I mean, Bruce Willis, I think, is just is just fantastic, and of course. As we know, he is he is going through some very, very serious problems with his health at the moment, isn't he? That's right, and it's, it's good to see him in his heyday, and this yeah. is quite a nice way of paying tribute to him, I think, to watch that. Yeah. yeah. Um, second Christmas movie of your selection. I will hold my hands up here, guys, and say, right now, I've never seen it. I've never seen it. The Sound of Music. What's I'm, that all about, I'm then? shocked and appalled. <laughs> the Sound of Music is an absolute... Classic film. Mm. I think the mistake some people think is that it's all songs and therefore it's a light-hearted musical. Mm -hmm. But it deals with very, very serious themes. Well, very... there's some Nazis in it. Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. And it's based on you know Lucy on a true story. Mm. Um, but it's also got very sharp comic writing, um, stunning cinematography, beautiful performances. I grew up watching this on TV every mm. Christmas on the sofa with the family. Love it. I, just, I don't see the thing is look there are there are some kind of musical films that I have enjoyed I I played the Artful Dodger many many years ago in Kyle Academy's wonderful production of Oliver uh, I won't do my Cockney accent at the moment oh. but 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 Julia Julia Andrews I don't know it's, well, you might like the fact that Christopher Plummer's character is the kind of cynic who sort of undercuts her sort of rather mm. wide-eyed enthusiasm so there is slightly kind of cynical sense of humour running mm -hmm. through it I can say it's quite sharp comedy. Mm -hmm. I honestly give it a try. My, my husband actually watched it eventually with me and, and had to concede that it is a very well-made film indeed. See, the thing is, I, it, and it is not a Christmas movie, but I watch it every Christmas, Singing in the Rain. Now, that, that for me, running up walls and singing, what more could you ask for? So, um, another one on this list, I have to say, that, that, that I might not have watched... Um, the Holiday. I, have, I, I don't even know if I've heard of this one. It's a very popular one, um, which has become a bit like Com Comfortable to Love, actually. Mm -hmm. a romantic comedy, um, Kate Winslet, Cameron mm -hmm. Diaz, Jude Law. It's about a house swap. Um, so, oh, no, I do so know what you, you're talking about. You do about. know. It's, it's become a bit of a modern classic. Uh -huh. um, I remember reviewing it sort of fairly cynically at the time, but, you know, audiences love it, and I think there's something about this, is that there's a virtue to its predictability. You kind of know that everyone's going to have a lovely romance, and you've got the cosy Christmas jumpers in this in this English village which doesn't really exist mm. and then you, you've got this you know glamorous house swap in LA and and it's, it just it does what it says in the tin how, how does how does Jack Black perform as a romantic lead yeah, there's a good question he's very funny mm. he, is, <laughs> he, he is exceptionally he is exceptionally funny I will grant you that school of rock another favorite movie of mine but but, but do you like watching rom com -y stuff come Christmas. I, I, will, I, have, I will say I have watched, on occasion, things like, you know, Love Actually, around about that time of year, which is clearly a Christmas film, but, but I'm, I'm not the world's biggest fan of the rom-com. Is there enough in the holiday to keep me entertained? I think just about. If, <laughs> but, if, but if you say you don't like a rom-com, I think that's a bit of a warning signal, mm. and I would say... Yeah, it's, it's a rom-com for rom-com fans. Mm. So maybe just see The Sound of Music. I'll, 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 yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll add it to my planner, obviously. Um, final film on the list, and this one you are going to get two thumbs up from me for. Uh, Will Ferrell in Elf, the ultimate Christmas movie, and someone very close to me is very, very happy uh, that it's on the list as well. But for those who haven't seen it, tell us the story. So Will Ferrell plays a man who thinks he's an elf because he's been adopted by elves. Oh, and as we can see, he is rather large size by comparison. And he comes um, to the big city looking for his real father, who, of course, is a cynical businessman. Um, so, again, it's about the sort of naive, wide-eyed person coming into sort of, you know, odds with people who are a little bit more cynical. And he wants to preach the, the lovely values of Christmas, of singing, of eating what you like, of having a great time, of, of, of being kind to people, of hugging people. And none of that plays very well in the big no. city. Um, so there's a lot of comedy, a lot of fish-out-of-water comedy there. Mm. And, it, and But this got so much heart, hasn't it? Yeah, and that's it does. Why and I love and it, has me, it has me laughing from start to finish and remind me because it's her name has slipped my mind the quirky actress who's, Zoe Deschanel exactly yeah. who's, who's great in it as well and just provides that kind of that, those kind of doughy eyes that she does an awful lot in films just at the right point just at the right moment um, but look Anna, whilst you are here it has been a big big old year in film and Oscar nominations are now are now out we won't we won't go through the list but two of the two of the biggest films of the year, Barbie and Oppenheimer. I can't, I can't actually believe I'm saying them in the same sentence. But there was there was a really curious thing that happened with them this year. 
out at the same time. And they were they were both doing massive numbers, weren't they? I think they helped each other, ultimately. Mm. It was wonderful. I loved that. You know, everyone that worked in cinema was so happy that people were finally going, yes, let's go to the cinema in a group, let's dress up for mm. Barbie, probably not for Oppenheimer. <laughs> um, Maybe let's not, yeah. do a double bill. I mean, hats off to anyone watching who did a double bill, because I don't think I would have done that. I think I'd watch Oppenheimer <laughs> first and then go for right, the light yes, relief. Right, yes, then you need yeah. the light relief, definitely. Um, but I thought they were both very good in their own right, mm. and it's great to see them recognised. And I think it was a wonderful thing for cinema this year, and hopefully people got back into that habit of going to the big screen and and having a great time if you had to choose between the two of them which would you go for and greta garwigs or yeah yeah barbie, barbie. <laughs> i mean it is it, I, I again i i have i have yet to see it all the way through i, I went to watch it and I, I i got i got called by work actually which meant i had to leave but it was it was I, I i don't know what i was expecting when i went in but what was on the screen was not what i was expecting it's very sharp and i think i saw it i've seen it second and a third time and mm. actually you get more of it on each viewing mm. and I, I guess i had very high expectations so because Gre greta gerwig's amazing filmmaker mm. but i think the fact that it's sort of getting its message across to a young audience but in a way that's making everybody laugh mm. and actually cry a little bit yeah. is very impressive um, well, Anna, thank you so much for taking us through the suggestions. Thank you so much for being with us uh, this year as well. And a very Merry Christmas Merry to Christmas. you. Merry Christmas. Uh, all that done, so let's get the latest sport now. Chris is standing by at Sky Sports News. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with Vitality. Ajin, thanks for letting us share your match day experience. You've just landed at Humberside Airport. Yeah. Tell us about your day so far. Actually, <laughs> my day is a little strange uh, because uh, Turkey doesn't use uh, summer time. I have a big advantage in flying to England because I almost land in the time I start the journey. Then for me, the plane is like a bed. And it's very important for you that you're here to attend the games for Hull City, especially with the team going so well? The only game I missed this season, actually, uh, was the game uh, the president's brother's uh, son was getting married. So uh, I had to attend in that married. Apart from that, uh, I've been all the games home, and I can see that half of the games away. So we've got a busy day yeah. ahead of us, and I think the next stop is the the club store to meet some of the fans. Yeah. Let's go and meet the fans then. Yeah. Born and raised in Hull. In Hull, yeah. yeah. Grandfather Hull, everybody Hull. But his dad supports Leeds United. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. How important is it for you to have this interaction with the fans? Because when you took over, you made it clear that yeah. the fans were a, a big part of the project for you. Actually, our average attendance was 8,000 uh, when uh, we were buying the club. So uh, 8,000 was not a good number uh, for a beautiful club like this. So we were dreaming to make it 15,000, 14, 15,000. Now we have the 20,000 average. So I can see that it's more than the dream. I'm so happy that the fans are now back to the stadiums and back to the stores. So uh, football is nothing without fans. So our fans, by the way, are always, you can see today, uh, energetic, young, and uh, I think that uh, the, when you look at them, they see in their eyes the passion for the club and the love for the club. We've seen you walk through town today and yeah. the fans are coming up and there does appear to be a lot of love and that's not always the case with football club owners, is it? I don't know about other owners because everybody has his own style. I always have uh, projects and we have new projects to make them happy. You know, last year we took them to Turkey uh, for a trip. Uh, I'm dreaming of another trip, maybe, uh, somewhere. It's a surprise. So, uh, to live together, to enjoy together, and to share uh, your pain when you lose together is always the best thing in life. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Chris, thanks very much. We are going to take a short break. Coming up next...
It's taken the best part of four decades, but at last, wham, I've made it to Christmas number one. We've done nearly 9,000 hours of rescue this year. Um, and we're an all volunteer team, so that puts quite a strain on all our team members. Um, so yeah, we're looking at ways of reducing that number and keeping people safe on the hills. It has been tracking the number of visitors in the last few years. This increase over the last year, we don't really have enough data as to, to why that sudden increase of 25%, but generally, we. Snowdonia is getting a lot more visitors and that just reflected in the, uh, the amount of rescues that we're carrying out. If they're on the mountain, they're part of you know the mountain community, um, even if it is just their first time, and we will step in and help out. Um, but we are looking at other agencies as well, working with other agencies to maybe see if we can do something to re reduce the sort of the low level rescues that we have to carry out as well. People who are not mountain aware don't realize the change in the weather from down in the valley to the summit and back again and how that can change, not just with the altitude, but during the day. So you could start off on a nice sunny winter's day and by three or four o'clock, it's getting dark. The weather's closed in, you can't see where you're going and suddenly it's sleeting and snowing. Um, and yeah, that can make a big impact on people's confidence and their ability to get off the mountain. We don't advise people not to go in the mountains. We don't see ourselves as gatekeepers. Um, the mountains are a great place to get fit. Um, it's acknowledged that spending time outdoors is great for your mental health. So we're certainly not gatekeepers. We just want people to ask some very simple questions about, do I know where I'm going, what I'm doing? Have I got a plan for the day? Have I got a plan B for the day? Um, do I know what the weather's doing? Not just what it looks like outside when I start, but what's the weather planning to do? Uh, bearing in mind that the mountain weather can be pretty unpredictable. And finally, do I have the right gear? And if you ask yourself all these questions and you find some of them are, you're not sure, then see what you can do to address it or come up with a different plan. Five of us have made it out of the car. Welcome to Backstage, the film and TV podcast. Welcome back. Now, as you may or may not know, this is not the only show I present on Sky News. They do like to get their money's worth. You can also find me and my impressive tan on the Daily Podcast. Every weekday, we take a look at one particularly interesting thing in the day's news and spend a bit of time trying to get a better understanding of it. However, this week, we've got a few specials looking back at the year in news. In essence, we have had our economics editor, our political editor, our royal correspondent, our science and technology editor, all coming together to tell us what has happened in 2023 in their respective areas. For example, the last one there with Laura Bunduk, what 2023 has taught us about the royal family. But that is enough about my podcast. We've just got time to tell you about this. Nearly 40 years after its release, and isn't that guaranteed to make you feel old, the Wham! Hits, Last Christmas, will be number one at Christmas. The song beat rivals, including Eurovision winner Sam Ryder, to the top spot, as our arts and entertainment correspondent Katie Spencer reports. Last Christmas. Try as you might, it's become an unavoidable festive classic. 
a tune as much a part of this time of year as sprouts are. But in terms of Christmas number one, Wham's classic has always been the bridesmaid, never the bride, until now. Wham! And Last Christmas is your official Christmas number one today. Andrew Ridgely from the band joining us right now. How do you feel? First time at Christmas being number one. Does it feel like a relief in any way? Does it feel like a big moment? It is a big moment. And it's a big moment for uh, me and for everyone involved with Wham! and and George Michael. You know, it, when Yog wrote this track, he wrote it with number one in mind. That was the goal. So how did they do it? Well, after their five-year dominance of making sausage roll-based puns for charity, Lad Baby dropping out of the running certainly helped matters. Instead, Eurovision runner-up Sam Ryder came the closest to causing an upset, bagging second place, but A for effort after giving an impressive 26 live performances of his new tune in the last six days and getting a little help from the official chart algorithms. It's supposed to benefit new songs. Um, when they started allowing streaming into the charts in general, the general rule was is that they had to, every old heritage song had to sell double two per unit of what a new song would sell just to give the new stuff a chance. But somehow people just want those old songs so much. Since its release back in 1984, the popularity of Last Christmas has taken on a life of its own. For evidence of its all-pervading dominance, well, look no further than the phenomenon that is Whamageddon, a challenge that's grown in recent years among those in the know who try to do all they can to avoid hearing the song before Christmas, which is virtually impossible. <laughs> As Northampton Football Club can attest, the ground's DJ forced to apologise for playing it at the start of this month. Around the world, the struggle has been real. I just lost Whamageddon today. I literally, I kid you not, I made it like, six, I made it 16 days. I refuse to lose Whamageddon between now and the 25th. Last Christmas, I gave you my heart. It wouldn't be Christmas without it. This year, the song about broken hearts finally gets its happy ending. Katie Spencer, Sky News. Just got time to see how the weather's looking as we edge into Christmas. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to sponsored by Qatar Airways. Mm, I'm afraid at this stage it looks as only parts of the north will see a white Christmas as those uh, conditions remained mostly mild and windy in the run-up to the 25th. This evening, the rain spreading north will become heavier, with snow likely in the north and east of the country, where the few centimetres of lying snow are possible, even to lower levels. Elsewhere, mild but windy with localised gales. If you're in Glasgow, as my friend Aideen is, I'm afraid it's going to be raining. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. And that is your lot for the final Friday night show of the year. Thank you so much for joining us over the past few months. Make sure you have a great Christmas coming up. It's Animal News at 10. We'll see you come the new year. Merry Christmas.